We are live. Please start. Latashe are they? Good morning, Lata. Is there any problem with you? Good morning, everyone. Today we are starting uh, Sepsis AKI webinar symposium on behalf of WIN and uh, uh, Department of Nephrology, Shantiram Medical College. Uh, I request Dr. Jikki, madam, to start the session, uh, to start the opening remarks of uh, uh, opening remarks of Sepsis AKI webinar. Jikki, madam. Yes. Am I audible to you, Saivani? Yeah, madam. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, everybody. My teachers and my dear friends. Welcome to the webinar symposium on sepsis AKI under the auspices of the WIN AP chapter. Uh, this sepsis associated AKI or SAKI is a very common problem which we meet with in day to day practice. And uh, I congratulate Dr. Saiwani for the enthusiasm to organize this webinar with a better understanding of the pathophysiology and putting into practice on the bedside. The mortality and the morbidity have come down over the past decade. And uh, over to Dr. Nagajyoti from Tirupati to talk on the insights into the pathophysiology of sepsis-associated AKI. Thank you, Saiwani, for giving me this opportunity. Over to Dr. Nagajyoti. Uh, yeah. Madam, Madam. Uh, Vani, I'm not getting to, I'm not sharing. able to share my screen slides. Can you share on my behalf? Okay. I have sent you the PPT. Okay. It's coming as a quoted document. Okay, one minute. I'm, I'm trying to see whether I'm able to share. I'm not able to share the document. Madam, uh, one minute, madam. Sorry for the inconvenience. I request our uh, PG postgraduate Lata Sri to start the session, uh, to initiate the session once again with a prayer. Lata, please unmute yourself. Provide supportive treatment and limit further minutes. 
And in today's webinar, we are going to know in total about the six second. And uh, I'm going to start the webinar with the uh, prayer song. Shall I start? Vani, shall I start the meeting? Recharge option for the system. Easy to keep it steady. Akash, uh, nah. I request Dr. Nagajyoti to start the new insights into pathophysiology of such a second. Good morning, everyone. I thank uh, Veen and Dr. Saiwani, uh, Madam, and my teachers and uh, seniors for giving me this opportunity to share uh, new insights into pathophysiology of PK. Sepsis AK. Am I audible, Vani? Hello? Yes, sir. You are audible. You are audible now. Yeah. Just a one minute. So Let how me will you take the slide? Please. Interesting. Slide change it, Madam. Ani, na day pe na ka slide ever um atne change us kada. Me take. Yeah. Thank you. So can you put it on the full screen mode? Ma'am, I am not sharing, Madam. The tech is sharing, Madam. I have some problem yeah. with sharing yeah. the slide. Yeah. Tell them to put it on full screen. No, no, it is yeah. in full screen. It is in full screen. It is it seems, Ma'am. And now, see, this is a third international consensus definition for sepsis and septic shocks as the uh, sepsis three definition. Here, the current guidelines and terminology are 2015 definition is sepsis is life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. This is associated with an in-hospital mortality greater than 10%. And the next is septic shock. Septic shock is a subset of sepsis in which underlying circulatory and cellular or metabolic abnormalities are profound enough to substantially increase the mortality up to 40%. So how the clinical criteria include suspected or documented infection and an acute price of greater than two or equal to so far points. This is as a, considered as a proxy for organ dysfunction. In for septic shock, the clinical criteria includes 
sepsis and vasotherapy needed to elevate map greater than or equal to 65 millimeters of mercury and lactate greater than 2 millimoles per liter or 18 milligrams per deciliter despite adequate fluid resuscitation. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. This is, we have previously two definitions, definitions of sepsis, sepsis 1 and sepsis 2. Later, there were third consensus, they have given sepsis 3, their guidelines. But why do we require so many definitions of sepsis? Why we abandoned the sepsis 2 guidelines means here, there was a limitations for previous revisions because we have focused, excessive focus on inflammation and we believe that sepsis is a continuum which progresses from sepsis to severe sepsis 2 and septic shock. And there was an inadequate specificity and sensitivity regarding SIRS criteria. So in these recent third consensus guidelines, we have removed the term severe sepsis and have, we have excluded the SIRS criteria. We have only considered sepsis and septic shock. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is the operational, operationalization of clinical criteria for identifying patients with sepsis and septic shock. So if you have a patient with suspected infection, then go for a quick SOFA score. Then what is the role of quick SOFA, SOFA score is in patient or general ward patients, if you want to determine who are going to be severely affected, only for severe sus sepsis, suspicion only it is not included in definition of the sepsis. So if you have an a suspect, still suspected SOFA score, Use of first score is uh, still suspected. No, sepsis is still suspected, but it is yes. Then assess for evidence for organ dysfunction. You assess evidence for organ dysfunction by uh, calculating the SOFA score. The SOFA variables are PAO to FIO2 ratio, Glasgow Coma scale, mean arterial pressure, administration of acetylcholine with the type and dose of rate of infusion, serum creatinine or urine output, bilirubin and platelet count. If there is an acute rise of SOFA score for more than or greater than two, then we consider it as a sepsis. Then, despite we, we go for adequate fluid, res, uh, fluid resuscitation, despite of adequate flu, fluid resuscitation, if you need a vasopressor to maintain MAP greater than 65 millimeters of mercury, or if serum lactate is more than 2 millimolar, then you consider the patient is in septic shock. That means the patient has increased uh, chance of increased mortality. And next slide, please. So, coming to definition of sepsis AKI. AKA in the presence of sepsis without other significant contributing factors explaining. Simul uh, so simultaneous clinical criteria, simultaneous presence of both sepsis 3 criteria and KDGO, AKA definition according to KDGO or Akin or rifle criteria for AKA. Annual global incidence of sepsis AKA might be approximately 6 million cases or nearly 1 per 1,000 population. And sepsis is found in about 40 to 50% of patients with AKA in the mm. ICU. So it's a very huge burden. So what is the clinical significance? It's, as sepsis AK is strongly associated with poor clinical outcomes, higher risk of in-hospital deaths, a longer hospital stay compared with AK from any other cause, mm -hmm. and in-hospital RRT requirement was strongly associated with hospital mortality. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. Coming to pathophysiology of sepsis AK. See, these pathophysiological mechanisms are not well understood due to several technical, technological, and ethical restrictions that converge around this field. So, hence, therapy remains only reactive and non-specific, no available preventive strategies. The current evidence comes from most of the knowledge comes from animal models of sepsis, in vitro cellular studies, and post-mortem observations in septic humans. National Institute of Health in the United States have begun the kidney protection precision medicine project that aims to expand our understanding of AKA by obtaining kidney, bi kidney biopsies in patients with AKA. So the current prevailing pathophysiological paradigm attributes sepsis AKA to decreased global renal blood flow and secondary tubular epithelial cell death or acute tubular necrosis. Mm. Reason for this belief was that the leading cause of AKA, including sepsis, major surgery, heart failure, and other causes are all associated with hypoperfusion and shock, ischemic cellular injury causing extensive cell death that is acute tubular necrosis. Next slide, please. So what are the new insights? See, ischemic reperfusion injury is not the only mechanism of sepsis AKA. Sepsis AKA develops even in the absence of renal hypoperfusion and clinical signs of hemodynamic instability. This was in histopathological findings in postmortem observations and harvested animal organs show that the uh, these uh, lesions are not as severe as expected and do not correlate with the 
functional alterations. Hence, a multiple mechanisms including adaptive mechanisms in which cells prioritize survival at the expense of organ function must also be at play. Hence, a unified theory of sepsis aka has been proposed. Regardless of the organ, three mechanisms are consistent with sepsis organ injury. They are inflammation, microcirculatory dysfunction and metabolic reprogramming. Next slide, please. So, microcirculatory and inflammatory alterations. When a pathogen is invaded into, into a host, then dams and pumps, damage associated molecular patterns and pathogen associated molecular patterns are released into the vascular stream. These molecular patterns are recognized by membrane bound TLR2, toll like receptors 2 and 4 of the immune cells and the endothelial cells, which cause increased synthesis of pro inflammatory cytokines, reactive oxygen species, and oxidative, increased oxidative stress. Hence, a rolling adhesion of leukocytes and platelets, resulting in increased risk of thrombi formation, flow continuity alterations, intermittent or no flow, increased vascular permeability, and leakage occurs, causing interstitial edema and increasing oxygen diffusion to the start upon a brand tubular epithelial cells next slide please next slide. so this is the pictorial diagram explaining this see microcirculatory and inflammatory alterations include microcirculatory changes like intraglomerular shunts and decreased glomerular pressure due to constriction of the apparent arteriole and dilatation of apparent arteriole causes decreased glomerular, glomerular pressure and decreased GFR. In this figure, we can see there is a shunted blood flow and also there is a uh, constriction of the uh, apparent arteriole and dilatation of the apparent arteriole right, causing decreased glomerular pressure and decreased GFR. The blue markers are all are dams and pumps. These uh, dams and pumps uh, uh, stimulate the uh, endothelium, endothelium uh, act, endothelial activation. So the continuous uh, Preserved convection flow is altered and there is a diapodesis and inflammatory cytokines causing endothelial damage and leakage causing interstitial edema and increased oxygen distance between oxygen distance between the to the tubular epithelial cells. Those this diagram depicts about microcirculatory and inflammatory alterations. Can I go to the next slide, ma'am? Next slide. So what is metabolic reprogramming? These PAMs and DAMs in, released in the intravascular compartment also combine with the TLR2 receptors, TLR2 and TLR4 receptors of the tubular epithelial cells. These tubular epithelial cells causes metabolic repro reprogramming and paracrinal signaling. So what is the metabolic repro reprogramming? There will be reprioritization of energy, energy consumption by decreasing the non-vital functions of the tubular cells that include ion transport and cellular replication. Reprogramming metabolism by switching aerobic glycolysis, by switching to aerobic glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation because there will be increased energy consumption during sepsis. And restoration of mitochondrial pool by mitophagy. Mitophagy means autophagy of the defective, defective mitochondria and biogenesis means synthesis of new mitochondria. Next slide, please. Next slide. So this is the uh, pictorial diagram. No, previous slide. Previous slide, please. Previous slide. Yeah, this is this is the pictorial di uh, pictorial diagram representing the mitochondria metabolic reprogramming. Here we can see reprioritization of energy consumption. The ATP is conserved by endocytosis and decreased expression of ion transporters and hence decreasing the ionic transport by paracrinal signaling. What is happening? That is happening. Or what is there is a cell cycle. So active cellular replication is lost. And there is a release of biomarkers of uh, biomarkers which are predictive of AKI. Then reprogramming of metabolism occurs because of restoration of the uh, reprogramming of metabolism and restoration of mitochondrial pool occurs for increased generation of the ATP. So from anaerobic uh, stage, the cells in cells move to oxidative phosphorylation and aerobic glycolysis for synthesis of ATP. And also the mitophagy occurs and also biogenesis occurs. All this mechanism occurs at the cellular level to, to, uh, uh, to promote the cellular survival. This, this is an adaptive mechanism for cell survival at the cost of function. So with this theory, we can explain the functional and structural alterations what we have observed in the biopsies of AKI patients. Hence, this theory has been proposed. Apart from ischemic reperfusion injury, which was considered as the most predominant cause of AKI, 
aka now a microcellular micro circulatory disturbances are more common in sepsis aka and cell survival is given a uh, cell survival is most important and adaptive changes of cell survival uh, at the cost of the function takes place at the cellular level next slide please next slide so with these new insights in the pathogenesis i want to share this last last slide see this is a uh, uh, slide they representing the prognosis of the ak so initially we can uh, count uh, a patient can come with sepsis and ak or ak can develop in the due course of the sepsis with the sepsis ak the course of the patient can be early reversible with appropriate early diagnosis early treatment fluid reversible early antibiotic um, early antibiotic uh, management and removal of septic focus or in the due course there may be a relapse of another ak he may go for a partial recovery or he may not recover he may have a persistent acute kidney disease or he may succumb to death so in some cases there may be complete recovery okay and as a persistent ak ak can go to ckd and ckd can lead to ak ak can lead to ckd and he might have in future course sepsis cvd and he may go he may uh, he may be a ckd patient also so with this new insights of pathology pathology we have to uh, we have to wait and watch whether we can use uh, any role of bio biomarkers or any new therapy such as uh, uh, blood purification therapies any normal pharmacological therapy can be useful in prevention of ak or treatment of ak or early diagnosis of ak but at now at currently all are at the experimental level thank you hello ah uh, hello ma'am nagajyoti i congratulate yes, you on a very vivid and extensive insights into the pathophysiology of saki And thank you ma'am and we can move on to the next topic thank you ma'am thank you very much am i audible yeah madam um, yeah um good morning everyone am i audible to yes ma'am yeah so good morning everyone i think that was a very good talk uh, dr nag jyoti thank you ma'am uh, moving on to our next topic um, i i have pleasure in introducing the dr sai vane i don't think anybody needs introduction because she is the one who is organizing this seminar nevertheless uh, she is a product of karnal medical college and dm from usmania so anybody who has done a dm from usmania i consider them my own children so uh, that way you know it, we we all belong to the same family uh, dr saiwani uh, is a brilliant has a brilliant academic record she has uh, won gold medals in mbbs md and also she was state first in dm she has 7 uh, years experience in nephrology care and she does a lot of community service and awareness programs in and around nandya and uh, she's just started her career and i'm sure she has got uh, a bright future ahead she already has nine publications to her credit and it is my pleasure to welcome uh, dr saiwani to talk on approach to sepsis ak dr saiwani please thank you very much madam for your kind introduction now i'm i move on to approach to sepsis ak so what is sepsis ak actually our previous speaker has told everything sepsis can precede aki or aki can precede sepsis or sepsis and aki can uh, occur simultaneously now i go with a a case scenario a 62 year old female diabetic since 10 years and hypertensive presented to us with vomiting intermittent fever with chills and rigor since 3 days and she was not having any urinary complaints or no cough or any symptom to localize the cause of fever on examination when she presented to us her vitals were she is febrile with temperature of 1 or 2 and pulse rate was 145 bp was 120 by 70 and saturations were 93 and rumai and her respiratory rate was 30 all this fit into the 
uh, search criteria. There are more than three positive in search criteria. And systemic examination, cardiovascular or respiratory system, uh, not much findings were present. And she is non-allegoric. And her investigation stable, the WBC count of 19,500, and her creatinine of 3.4, and urine was active, showing active sediment, and LFT was normal, and lactate was 4. According to the recent sepsis 3 criteria, which was introduced by our uh, previous speaker, she be belongs to sepsis because she was having lactate data four and so far score was two. So next, uh, I, I already we know about SERS, sepsis, severe sepsis and septic shock. Our patient is a candidate of severe sepsis as she, as she was having sepsis as so far was two and lactate of four with uh, with organ dysfunction. So she, is, she belongs to severe sepsis at presentation. Next, uh, these are the differences between uh, sepsis 1 and 2 and sepsis 3 criteria. This was already highlighted by our previous speaker. And going, moving on to predictive factors for early sepsis. There were two, uh, there are so many, but the important were identification of early sepsis by Q SOFA score, that is respiratory rate, altered mentation, and systolic blood pressure. If respiratory among these three, if two are positive, it should be taken as positive. But in our case, only one is positive, that is only respiratory rate is positive. So Q SOFA doesn't signifies that she was suffering from sepsis. Another is national early warning score. Here, this is the national early warning score, and she was having among six parameters. She was having respiratory rate more than 30, and her oxygen saturations were 93. So there were uh, two marks, and uh, uh, arterial, uh, and she was not requiring any supplemental oxygen, and her temperature is. Uh, 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 more and uh, she got the two and her systolic blood pressure is normal and her heart rate is more than 140 that is three so in total of she was having uh, nine nine so uh, uh, in total of she was having nine points in this national early warming score it indicates the sensitivity of news in, in, uh, to diagnose the early sepsis. So Q so far, she was not having sepsis, but in according to news, she was having early sepsis. And even the uh, uh, sepsis guidelines recommend that you uh, Q so far, they won't take uh, Q so far, they have recommended against Q so far, and they have recommended news as the diagnosis in predicting the early sepsis in our patient. So they have recommended against Q so far compared to news. And another thing what we should know is SOFA score. It is a sequential organ failure assessment score. Here we have we will uh, here they will take six systems: respiratory system, coagulation system, liver, cardiovascular, CNS, and renal system. According and they were graded according to the severity into 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And this predicts the mortality. So if you see any case in critical care unit, if you have the SOFA score, you can predict. The mortality and you have you can con, uh, confidently say to the attenders about the mortality now at presentation she was having only renal creatinine of 3.4 so she was having two at presentation so so far score was two and her mortality was less than 10 percent at presentation so does, does she having AKI? Yeah, she is having AKI according to the Rifle, Akin and Kedigo. She belongs to stage two because her creatinine is 3.4. We doesn't know about the baseline and her she is non-oliguric at presentation. So approach to our case. Whenever you uh, come across a case of sepsis, we should have two pronged approach. One is infection directed management. Another is the support to care. First, we'll move with the infection directed management. So rapid infection diagnosis. In infection directed management, what is the newer tool is focus. That is point of care ultrasound. Here we will see lung eight point ultrasound, like where we do percussion and all. We can diagnose whether it is uh, having pneumonia or fluid overload. Everything can be uh, diagnosed and it's a simple bedside tool. Another is going to abdomen. Here we can see whether kidneys have any 
phyllonephritis, any hydroeretoronephrosis, which can indicate the source of sepsis. And heart, heart. We know the with the two uh, D echo of heart. We we'll, we can know the cause of septic shock or cause of shock we are dealing with. And CT abdomen and chest after the initial ultrasound to confirm the diagnosis which we have entertained in the focus. So in our case, rapid infection diagnosis is with a focus. Here, lung ultrasound. Uh, had revealed only bilateral minimal pleural effusion, but abdominal ultrasound was showing bulky right kidney. And CT KUB was showing bulky right kidney with perinephric stranding. HRCT chest was bilateral minimal pleural effusion. All these things will focus, uh, will uh, show us that the patient is suffering from some urinary tract infection, which is the source of sepsis for her. So according to surviving sepsis guidelines, she is not having septic shock. So we have initiated her on IV antibiotics within three hours as she was a candidate of sepsis. So when to initiate uh, antibiotics uh, according to uh, surviving sepsis guidelines, we should not take procalcitonin as the marker to initiate antibiotics because procalcitonin can also be elevated in inflammatory conditions, not, not only just with the infection. So we should have strong suspicion of sepsis according to sepsis 3 criteria and we have to initiate the antibiotics as our patient is having sepsis according to SOFA. So we are initiated antibiotics as she was not having shock and we have initiated antibiotics within three, three hours. And coming to which type of antibiotic we have to use. According to these guidelines, they have recommended MRACS uh, uh, when the patient is having at risk factor for MRSA. So what are the MRSA risk factors? One is colonization or uh, colonization with MRSA or having IV antibiotics or having recurrent skin infections or invasive diseases or hemodialysis or hospital admission prior to our uh, approach. So our patient was not yet started on hemodialysis. So she, uh, she was not a candidate to initiate MRSA. So we have not started her on MRSA. Only we have started a uh, broad spectrum antibiotic covering uh, co uh, covering gram negative uh, illness. So, how to deliver the antibiotics? According to guidelines, for beta lactams, as the trough level is important for beta lactams, we have to give in a continuous infusion than intermittent infusion. Other, all other antibiotics like aminoglycosides or fluoroquinolones, their peak is important because pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics are very important for um, MIC concentration. Here, beta lactams, the guidelines recommend continuous infusion of antibiotics. So we have initiated in our case with broad spectrum antibiotics of uh, meropenum one gram in 100 ml NS with over four hours and followed by 500 mg infusion twice a day according to her renal abnormality. And she was not initiated on MRSA as she was not having any risk factors to initiate MRSA initially. After two days of hospital admission, the patient was deteriorated and she went into septic shock and her sofa was ten and uh, she, she was having severe metabolic acidosis and anuria for more than 12 hours and her stage of AKI initially was stage 2 and now progressed to stage 3. So we have escalated our antibiotics to two antimicrobials with gram-negative coverage. One is polis. So we have added polistin at renal modified doses and along with MRSA coverage because now uh, she is a candidate as uh, she was uh, deteriorated in the hospital after two days. So we have initiated her in vancomycin according to renal modified dose. So what the guidelines suggest? Here in sepsis or septic shock, now the patient progressed to septic shock. So we have initiated her on um, another gram-negative coverage polystin in addition to the meropenum as uh, uh, she was uh, progressed to septic shock. And, uh, uh, and uh, 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 so empirically, we don't treat with the 
two gram negative agents but as she was progressed to septic shock as the guidelines suggest we have initiated her on cholestin coming to source control so for adults with the sepsis or septic shock the guideline recommend identifying the specific anatomical diagnosis of infection and to start the treatment accordingly so in our case our source is the right kidney so we have consulted our urologist and initiated her and uh, requested him to uh, treat the pyelonephritis part and the urologist has kept digestent inserted on the right side so so with this uh, we have controlled the uh, source of uh, right kidney as the digestent was inserted the pus has uh, poured out next next is the glucose control she is a diabetic as the sepsis is hyperglycemic condition her rbs was 495 so we have initiated on her on insulin infusion and started with the target of rbs of 180 so as the as the guideline recommend uh, the rbs target was uh, kept at 180 and uh, we have more next is the nutrition coming to nutrition as early as possible enteral nutrition should be sought as the guideline suggests within 72 hours we have to initiate the enteral nutrition because as the bacteria from uh, gut may translocate outside and cause sepsis and severe sepsis so we in uh, in this uh, we should de escalate the iv and iv fluids and we should start enteral feeds and enteral fluids coming to the next pronged up in two pronged approach we have to move to the supportive care as we we uh, uh, we have stabilized her with antibiotics and we have escalated the dose in the supportive care whenever she presented with us to the shop we have moved her to icu and in the icu we have done focus to know the cause of shock here there are whenever you come across a case of shock there are four uh, causes of shock hypovolemic cardiogenic obstructive and distributive and in hypovolemic inadequate intravascular volume this is the first picture showing kissing ventricles where intravascular volume is meager here we have to give the fluid boluses and next the image showing cardiogenic shock here the failed left ventricle unable to contract it was dilated and the third one is the obstructive shock here the patient was having pulmonary thromboembolism so right atrium and right ventricle was dilated and on the fourth one and in cardiogenic shock another important is cord cardiac tamponade because of pericardial effusion which is causing compression of the right ventricle but in our patient we came across with the uh, kissing ventricles so we have initiated her supported uh, her on iv fluids so the bolus of 30 ml per kg with crystalloids rl ringer lactate as her potassium was uh, normal we have initiated her on 30 ml per kg bolus and Uh, what the guidelines say here many trials like process arise and promise they have advised only give iv bolus of 30 ml per kg but don't overload the patient with fluids because all uh, early goal directed therapy have showed there was no mortality ben benefit in uh, in overloading the patient with the iv fluids so we have initiated her on iv fluids of balanced crystallite solution rl and after the, uh, and another thing is which type of uh, in in shock we should know the four steps in resuscitation that is salvage in this salvage we have to maintain the map of 60 to 65 with the crystallites and uh, if the patient doesn't respond with the crystallite you initiate her on inotropes or vasopressor support and next is the optimization phase here map will be more than 65 and her perfusion and cardiac index will be improved then you think about the further continuation of crystallite 
Next is the stabilization. Here the patient is stable and her MAP is improved and organ support is achieved. And then you start for the de-escalation. In this de-escalation, reduce the fluids or decrease the inotropic and vasopressor support. So in whenever a patient is hemodynamically unstable, go with the salvage and optimization. As our patient now in shock, we went out ahead with the IV fluids. And when, is, when the patient is stable, you go with the stabilization and de-escalation protocol after the de-escalation to be done. So in our one bundle, we should send blood cultures prior to antibiotics, administration of broad spectrum antibiotics and administration of IV fluids, application of vasopressors and measurement of lactates when you receive a case of septic shock into the critical care unit. So, uh, what the guidelines say according to flu according to guidelines so they recommend crystallites over colloids and they suggest in sepsis or septic shock when we are giving crystallites more and we think large volumes of crystallites are being given go with the albumin otherwise first recommendation is crystallite but if the patient is in fluid overload and she requires more crystallites then you go with the albumin and this is only suggestion according to the recent trials. So coming to, uh, this is the type of resuscitation fluid. According to SAFE trial, crystallites are better than colloids. And according to Albio's trial, the, uh, uh, in septic subgroup, group, subgroup patients who were overloaded, you can give albumin, which decrease the 20%, uh, which decrease the 20, uh, mortality by 20%. So first, when you come across a patient of septic shock, go with the uh, crystalloids. If of overload is uh, uh, there, then go with the albumin. And in the crystalloids, there are so many trials that is salted SMART trial, which uh, compare the outcome of MAKE 30. Uh, they show that our buffered, balanced buffered solution are better than the normal saline. Here, what is MAKE 30 is uh, they have kept one outcome that is a composite of death, dialysis, and persistent renal dysfunction. And in this, they found that RL, our balanced uh, buffered solution is better than the normal saline. So following this uh, bolus administration, next move on to the maintenance fluid administration. And this is by static measures and dynamic measures. And now the guideline recommends for the dynamic measures to continue the maintenance fluids. And the guideline, the guideline recommends to give boluses of maintenance fluid rather than giving IV fluids continuously, depending upon the, these dynamic measures, that is passive leg grazing test, fluid challenge test. And this can be covered by my next speaker in hemodynamic monitoring. And in our case, we have started her on uh, crystalline, uh, that is a balanced uh, solution. And maintenance fluids was given dynamically uh, by seeing all the uh, uh, leg rising test and parameters. And we have given in the bolus type. And coming to the mean arterial pressure. So the guideline recommend to maintain the mean arterial pressure of 65. And it, it, uh, 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 it recommends against maintaining of more MAP, that is 70, 80. So for any septic shock patient, we should make sure that the MAP should be at 65. And to maintain the MAP of 65, the guideline recommends first to start with the norepinephrine, which is the drug of choice. And if this norepinephrine is not sufficient, we should not escalate the norepinephrine. We can add on to the vasopressin. The norepinephrine normal dose is 0.25 to 0.5. Don't go to the ma maximum of norepinephrine, but add vasopressin to the uh, uh, this norepinephrine. So this is so first vasopressor of agent is uh, norepinephrine. Next is the uh, uh, next is the vasopressin. And after that, you can go with the dobutamine or epinephrine. So in our case, the shock is hypovolemic and distributive due to sepsis. So we have given IV fluids, but the MAP was not improved. The MAP was 40. Then we have initiated her on vasopressors with noradrenaline, uh, 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 with noradrenaline infusion of 15 mics per minute. 
but with that also map was not raised and we didn't go to 30 micrograms which is the maximum dose of narad and we went to the uh, addition of vasopressin that is 0 0.03 microgram per minute and the map was raised to 62 so next comes the whether steroids should be given or not in as the guideline says steroids can be given when persistent need of vasopressor more than one hour. So we have initiated her on steroids, the hydrocortisone 200 mg per day to improve her BP. After two hours, MAP was falling to 52. So we again went ahead with the 2D echo, which was showing ejection fraction of 30%, which suggests uremic cardiomyopathy. So we have initiated her on inotropes. That is dobutamine at rate of 8 microgram per kg per minute. So inotropes, what the guidelines say? So they suggest adding dobutamine or norepinephrine or epinephrine if the patient is having cardiac dysfunction. As our patient was having 30% of uh, uh, ejection fraction, we have initiated her on inotropes. Next, biomarkers to discontinue the antibiotics. As the uh, that is uh, use of procalcitonin and clinical examination can be used to discontinue the uh, uh, to uh, discontinue or de-escalate the antibiotics. Coming to the mechanical ventilation, first we have to intubate her to reduce the work of breathing, and the uh, ventilatory settings were the tidal volume of six ml per kg, and uh, because. If these are lung protective unnecessarily the high tidal volume causes high oxygen into uh, oxygen delivery to the lungs and causes uh, oxygen delivery to the lungs and causes uh, uh, oxygen uh, uh, toxicity so I, all the guidelines recommend low tidal volume with 6 ml per kg and plateau pressure of 30 millimeters of mercury and peep of 8 to 12 millimeters of mercury as the me mechanical ventilatory setting. And my next speaker will speak on the uh, consensus regarding all these parameters. So, uh, so in our case, what happened is we have initially initiated and managed with the non-invasive ventilation, but as she was deteriorated, she was intubated and connected to the ventilator with the, uh, uh, with the tidal volume of 6 ml per kg and PEEP of 8 with FIO2 of 100%. And we went ahead with the source control that is right digestant. Next, when to initiate the kidney replacement therapy. Initially, when she arrived to us, she was in stage 2 AKI, but later she progressed to stage 3 AKI as she went on to anuria, anuria for more than two, 12 hours. So we have initiated her on kidney replacement therapy and there were uh, the guidelines say uh, there, uh, the benefits of early replacement is uh, not there. So there was no benefit for early, early to initiate kidney replacement therapy. And uh, uh, what is early and what is late means in the early, if the patient touches stage 3 AKI, we, we initiate uh, uh, kidney replacement therapy. In late, there is no benefit of uh, early initiation of kidney uh, in late. After uh, the uremic symptoms like uh, uh, uremic encephalopathy, severe metabolic acidosis, which is resistant to medical treatment, and uh, ion imbalance like hyperkalemia, they, these are the late indication for kidney replacement therapy. This can be dealt in my uh, dealt by my next subsequent speaker. And so uh, we have uh, initiated her as uh, her BP, uh, her, uh, she is in uh, severe metabolic acidosis and high procalcitonin and inotropic support and thrombocytopenia. We have initiated her on uh, CRRT and heme adsorption therapy. So this is the uh, extracorporeal blood purification system. Uh, but the meta-analysis are all are against the adsorption therapies, but single case reports have showed some benefit in these uh, adsorption therapies. And in this purification system, there are 
two types. One is convection therapy, another is adsorption, adsorption therapy. In normal thing, we go with the diffusion. That is normal hemodialysis is diffusion, high concentration to low concentration movement. But diffusion is inferior to convection. In this convection, we start uh, continuous renal replacement therapy. Here, uh, the um, solvent will move and bring the solutes. And here, high volume hemofiltration is the High volume hemofiltration is the uh, uh, CRRT modality. Uh, uh, high volume hem in uh, actually normally is the convection therapy is CRRT. Here we use 25 ml per kg per uh, hour as the convective dose. But some recommend high volume uh, hemofiltration, high cutoff membranes. But he he here the dose is increased, but they are proven not beneficial over ideal CRRT. And in adsorption therapies, the polymyxin B and cytokines. In polymyxin B, the thought was they absorb, absorb the bacteria. In uh, cytosol, they absorb the cytokines. So in combination therapies, uh, both convection plus adsorption will be there. And we went ahead with the combination of uh, CRRT and adsorption, that is oxidase for her and for her with the blood flow of 100 with convective dose of 25 ml per kg per hour and we have initiated her on heparin free dialysis as she was having thrombocytopenia after the source control and initiation of CRRT with oxiris, she was improving and inotropic support was tapered, gradually weaned from mechanical ventilator and extubated after three days. And de-escalation of antibiotics of MRSA was started as culture was showing Klebsiella, which was sensitive to meropenem. So we have stopped polystine and vancomycin and the meropenem was continued for the seven days. So Coming to the de-escalation of antibiotics, the guidelines suggest when you know the diagnosis of infection, which anti which microbe is causing the infection, then you de-escalate the other antibiotics. So we have de-escalated vancomycin and cholesterol. Coming to duration of antibiotics, after the source control, the need of antibiotics duration will come down. So in our case, we have controlled our source, as, uh, source of urosepsis with digestant. So we have cut short the total duration of antibiotics for seven days. And this is the uh, vitals and investigations of uh, our, uh, our patient. In, uh, on 17th, her BP was okay and uh, her pulse rate was okay after one dose of antibiotics. But after uh, 18th, she went into severe metabolic acidosis with SOFA score of 7 and uh, at 19, she had a uh, high pulse rate and she was initiated on NIV and uh, uh, her platelet count was dropped to 26,000 and her, more, uh, her SOFA score was increased. And on 20th, she was initiated on mechanical ventilator uh, she was uh, uh, initiated on CRRT and uh, she, CRRT was initiated on 19th night and uh, uh, with oxiris and she was intubated and connected to mechanical ventilator as she was deteriorating and and started on uh, uh, she, uh, and the CRRT kept in recirculation and went ahead for source control with digestanting. After 20th, after um, we have noticed the improvement of platelet count from 0 0.39 to 0 0.6 and uh, the FiO2 was decreased in mechanical ventilator and by 22nd, she went, into, she went on to TPs and on 23rd, uh, we have extubated her. And uh, these are the electrolytes. She was in, uh, though at 19, she was oligoanuric. Uh, she had uh, no, uh, no episodes of hyperkalemia. And on oxiris, she had hypokalemia. And this is the anuric phase where we go ahead with the uh, CRRT initiation. And the, at the initial initiation, her CRP was 269 and procalcitonin was 96 and D-dimer was elevated with INR of 2.6 and ejection fraction of 30%. But after control of sepsis, her CRP came down to 126 and procalcitonin was 42 and INR was decreased to 1.4 and her 2D echo ejection fraction improved to 48%. 
and uh, in this our patient of sepsis aki had progressed to akd because she was in our hospital with creatinine more than 2 for more than 7 days for 10 days and uh, but she was not progressed to ckd after 90 days of uh, her uh, hospital admission her creatinine was normal and urine was not showing any proteinuria and we have done one study on akis among 165 people among our study 105 were having uh, sepsis aki and uh, among them males were more and uh, uh, these are all the departments cardiology general medicine general surgery have contributed to these sepsis patient among them nephrology were having more sepsis aki as uh, it's common and uh, And among these 140 one not five patients a dialysis were required in 30 members and death was seen in seven people and uh, uh, and among these one not five patients uh, uh, akd were uh, uh, among one not five cases seven deaths occurred in the hospital and 29 deaths occurred after discharge within Uh, so uh, to, uh, after discharge, that is uh, uh, in uh, within uh, at ninety days when have, when we have inquired about them, thirty six died at ninety seven in hospital deaths and twenty nine after discharge. So this is an eye opener that after discharge of any any AKA patient, we should uh, call them and we should uh, ad advise them for the follow up so that we can minimize all these deaths. and among these one not five seven progressed to ckd and 62 were disease free uh, at 90 days of discharge and among one not five cases eight cases were septic shock and three died before the seven days and um, and uh, remaining five progressed to akd among the akd uh, two recovered uh, 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 Before seven days, three died and two recovered. And uh, uh, among AK, uh, three progressed to AKD. And among them, two recovered and one pro uh, one uh, expired. Among two, both went into CKD. Thank you for patient listening of this uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for your uh, lecture. yeah thank you saivani for that very exhaustive talk i think uh, you took more time but uh, nevertheless it was nice hand over the mic to the organizers for the next talk and uh, coming to the next session it's a hemodynamic monitoring of a case of sepsis aki and the speaker is dr uh, kavita ma'am md anesthesia and the moderator is dr hitai shima and i'd like to give a brief uh, cv about the dr hitai shima dr hitai shima had completed her mbbs and md pediatrics from sv medical college tirupati and dm and dnd from usmania medical college hyderabad and now working as consultant nephrologist at uh, manasa kidney foundation tirupati since 2002 and a brief introduction about dr uh, kavita ma Dr. Kalta, ma'am, uh, had completed MBBS at uh, Saint uh, Jesus Medical College, Mumbai, and had uh, done her MD Anesthesia College at GMC Nagpur, and IDCCM at the Sri Ramchandra Medical College, Porur, Chennai, and have a uh, professional experience as a consultant anesthesia surgeon for ten years in uh, ASIC Medical College, Chennai, VHS, and now working as assistant professor in ICU, Sri Ramam Medical, Sri Ramchandra Medical College, in Chennai from two thousand seven to till date. and i'd like to uh, i'll request ma'am kavita ma'am to start the session good morning everybody can you hear me yes sir uh, okay i just wanted to clarify okay thank you for inviting me um, i'm here probably an outlier over here as a critical care intensivist i hope uh, I, as uh, saivani has said she has actually covered a lot of the points which i need to cover on about regarding the uh, hemodynamic monitoring and the sepsis guidelines few points which she said which was definitely a new thing on the new guidelines one is um what i just want to just reinforce before i start on my talk is that uh, the early warning system is the one which is more used for diagnosing of sepsis no longer is so far recommended 
The second thing is about source control. If you ask me as an intensivist, which is a sepsis which I would love to treat, probably it would be urosepsis because the source control is so easy in the urosepsis. And as in the case which uh, Dr. Saiwani had presented, the source control was, uh, the moment the source control was done, the patient improvement was less significant. Like you see, day one, she has presented with urosepsis, day four, she went on to CRT and then there was a source control and then she started showing an improvement. So source control is very important. So maybe even if we had uh, did the source control much earlier, probably she would have even improved before that. So the best part about the urosepsis is source control is very easy and we need to aggressively focus on the source control and uh, other thing is about the appropriate antibiotics i would just like to differ over here a little bit is that one is that about the dual um, gram negative cover uh, uh, generally, the dual gram negative cover is not done routinely because we see a lot of resistance. So probably we can start on empiric meropenem, but before going on to stepping up to going on to dual anti uh, for gram negative cover with colistin, we would always want to uh, get the identify the organism. And here, probably if the microbiology lab invests in something called as a maldi tof, you can identify resistant genes and uh, treat the organism appropriately much faster. So the first, these were a few points which I would just like to add on to Dr. Saiwani's talk. We thank you, Dr. Saiwani, for inviting me for this uh, conference. Uh, coming on to my talk on hemodynamic monitoring. Uh, why uh, my talk would be divided on uh, uh, two things. One is uh, why is uh, hemodynamics important? Um, uh, what is the physiology? Uh, what are the tools of hemodynamic tools, which she has already mentioned about some of them. And I would just tell about two of the, the device, tools which we use commonly and the related evidences, the studies, which already some of the studies she's spoken about the process. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Can you hear me? Any issues, ma'am? Can I continue? Uh, yeah, continue. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 okay. Uh, coming on to the physiology, I would like few uh, basic points in the physiology to know because these were the these were the uh, these will be the things which I, I would be talking about the, the terminology. So I just want you to get a clarification of these terminologies, like what is systolic blood pressure, what is diastolic, what is mean, and what is pulse pressure, because we'll be talking a lot about the mean and the pulse pressure. Uh, systolic blood pressure is the main determinant of the left ventricular stroke one, so that's why we we look at systolic blood pressure when we look at a patient. The diastolic blood pressure depends on the peripheral resistance and the arterial compliance and the diastolic blood pressure is normally very low in a septic patient so suppose you want to differentiate between a septic and a, um, a cardiogenic shock patient just based on bp you need to look at the diastolic generally the diastolics will be running very low in a septic patient because of the uh, vasodilatation which occurs in sepsis patients then the mean arterial pressure this is what all of us keep talking about why because the mean arterial pressure it is determined both by the cardiac output and the peripheral resistance and this is the bp based the target uh, in which hemodynamic monitoring all is rotates around if you have a lot of studies like the sepsis spam study then the 65 trial study which is recent study which has come out because most organs auto regulate around the map and as all of us know in the map the main part, uh, main uh, contribution for this is uh, one third of the pressure is contributed by the diastolic BP. So again, the diastolic BP is very important. So in septic patients, when the diastolic BP drops, the MAP drops, and we have problems with the autoregulation of the organs. So that's why the MAP targets are what we look at. Coming on to pulse pressure, what is pulse pressure? Pulse pressure is the difference between a systolic and diastolic. And to look at, uh, and it is influenced by the stroke volume. Okay, so this is very important. Though. Since it is influenced by the stroke volume, that is cardiac, how much is the ejection at per uh, beat? This parameter is a parameter which is used to assess the fluid responsiveness. So whenever you look at the BP on the monitor, you will have a systolic BP, you will have a diastolic BP. MAP is a target BP which you will look at. And pulse pressure, is, some of the advanced monitors have pulse pressures which will be calculated. In some other, other monitors, we need to calculate the pulse pressure to decide on whether the patient is responsive or not. 
And uh, one point which I would just like to highlight is why CVP is not any longer important in the ICU is because uh, CVP depends on the RV compliance, it depends on the pulmonary vascular resistance, the mitral valve compliance, and the LV compliance. And it is ma many of these parameters uh, change in the ICU. Like many of your patients will have LV systolic dysfunction, they can have mitral valve pathology, they can be a patient of pulmonary hypertension. Because of all this, we do not any longer take CVP as a parameter to decide on whether we need to give fluids or not. And it's also a static measure. As Dr. Saivani had said, we look at dynamic measures. So static is very, it does not depend on the fluid responsiveness. I'll just come in detail about that in my next few slides. So initially, I'm just going to talk on the physiology before I go on to what are the monitoring tools on the hemodynamics. Coming on to our global list. Uh, uh, what we need to know is a, a few places where we can make a difference in the intervention, which leads to a difference in the outcome. If in the afferent artery arterial, if we give any drug which causes vasoconstriction, it decreases the GFR. While in the efferent arterial, if you use a drug which causes vasoconstriction, it increases GFR. So the drug which is used over here is the vasopressin. So these are the key parameters and vasoconstriction uh, uh, can occur when you use probably uh, drugs like NSAIDs or so we need to avoid such drugs in these septic patients. So these are important uh, points that you need to just remember. Uh, coming on to now, we start with the uh, assessment of the fluid responsiveness. So the basic uh, physiology that we need to know about this is that uh, we need to know what is this Frank standing for basically. Uh, this graph shows this is the stroke volume of the patient and this is how whether the patient is going to be improving with the uh, preload that you give, that is some fluid bolus is that you give. It depends on whenever there's some volume in the left ventricle, it stretches your muscle fibers and it increases in the contractility. So that occurs in the graph portion of from, from this part to this part. Once the patient reaches the flatter portion of the curve, how much of a fluids you infuse on the patient, it does not show an improvement in your cardiac contractility or improvement in the output. Okay. So if your patient is in this part of the graph, you can give them fluids. If your patient is in this part of the graph, you probably we have to stop restraining on the fluids and go on to vasopressors and other modalities to improve on the map. So our tools of hemodynamic monitoring are mainly focusing on identifying which patients are in this part of the graph and which patients fall into this part of the graph. Uh, so what are the measures of preload uh, responsiveness? They are the static indices and the dynamic indices. Static indices are generally not any longer used. They can be divided into pressure and volume indices that is CVP, pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, and the volume indices are right ventricle and diastolic volume, left ventricle and diastolic volume, global and diastolic volume. These are no longer recommended right now. What is used is dynamic indices. Dynamic indices is basically you uh, uh, group them into, that is, uh, you see whether a patient is going to be fluid responsive or not. So they are based on three modalities. One is based on cyclical variations on the stroke volume, which occurs. Suppose a patient is in mechanical ventilation. Because of the changes in the intrathoracic pressure, you can have changes in the volume, which is there. So that based on that, the few what tests that we use is pulse pressure variation, stroke pressure variation, and IOT blood flow, of which I will be talking in detail only about the pulse pressure variation because this is what is commonly used. The second one is based on the cyclical uh, variations and non-stroke or volume-related hemodynamic parameters, uh, like the vena cable uh, diameter, ventricular pre-ejection period. The group C, this is the one which is commonly used in all most of the ICUs, is based on preload dist redistribution manuals, okay. where uh, it is not necessary that the patient needs to be mechanically ventilated. You can use an either mechanical ventilator or, or non-mechanically ventilated patient. That is the biggest plus point of this. That is a passive leg raising manual. About this, I will be talking in detail and about focus about which that is POCUS focus is point of care ultrasound, which we use in any patient who presents to us with shock in the IC. Uh, coming on to the pulse pressure variation, basically, as I told you, what is pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and the diastolic. So uh, when you look at pulse pressure variation, it's basically you need to uh, look at what is the pulse pressure maximum in a patient 
and what is the pulse pressure minimum. This you can do with an arterial line monitor itself. Suppose your patient is, you need to have an invasive arterial line, which is prerequisite for this. And with this, uh, in the prerequisites, other prerequisites are the patient needs to be mechanically ventilated, patient needs to have a larger tidal volume. Uh, which usually is not done in our ICU patients. So that's why we do not use pulse pressure variation often in identified patients who can be identified by this. So uh, pulse pressure variation maximum, that is, you see, what is the maximum pulse? You, you look for three minutes, what is the maximum pulse pressure variation versus minimum pulse pressure variation, the difference between the two divided by the average of two into 100. If you get a percentage of more than 13% in this, you identify a call a patient that the patient is fluid responsive. So probably you can give them fluids. So there are two uh, terms, which terminologies, which are normally used. It need not be that a fluid responsive patient will be fluid tolerant. So that's where your point of care ultrasound comes. Even if a patient is fluid responsive, suppose the patient has got severe LV dysfunction and is in pulmonary edema, even if the patient is fluid responsive, I will not go ahead and give them fluids because I will look at the ultrasound B lines alone, which I will just come in detail and tell you about in later slides. So this is about the pulse pressure variation. Uh, this in many of the advanced monitor, arterial monitors, line monitors, you can have a look at, you can directly calculate the pulse pressure variation. You don't need to manually calculate this. Uh, the limitations, as I told you, the, the patient needs to be sedated, paralyzed, should not have its own respiratory efforts. The patient needs to be on volume control respiration, no ventilation, and the patient should not have any arrhythmias, invasive VP required. And uh, so these are our limitations because most of our patients, as uh, we notice, all our patients, we do not uh, ventilate with uh, such large tight volumes. Or if you want to do the test at that point of time, for some period, probably you might need to go off with larger tight volume ventilation. And many of our septic patients will be having arrhythmias. Again, if arrhythmias are there, this test cannot be used in them. And invasive monitoring, invariably, most of our patients will be having. The moment they go into septic shock, needing a NORAD requirement beyond 0.2 mics, we start them on invasive BP monitoring so that we do not we can uh, titrate the vasopressors and decide on fluids appropriately. Uh, coming on to the other parameter, the respiratory variability of the SVC and the IVC, uh, which is, again, just a very soft indicator based on which we decide on a patient can be given fluids. Suppose your patient has not got an arterial line and you need to just decide whether can I give or not from this patient. Uh, we can go it as a soft indicator because the positive pressure ventilation has a lot of effects on the SVC and IVC diameter. So based on this, we can decide on whether uh, that if you do not have an RTL line on other monitors, maybe as a soft indicator, you can decide on whether you can give. So what we look at is the IVC distensibility index. That is, you look at the IVC diameter. And if it is um, distended beyond 12%, then we can predict on fluid responsiveness. The other indicator is collapsibility index, which can be used in uh, a spontaneous breathing. It is very a gross idea is what you will know about the volume status. So this is the ultrasound in which you can see this is your IVC. IVC is measured normally two to three centimeters before it merges with the right atrium. Okay, and where the IVC walls are parallel. Again, the difficulty in uh, measuring IVC can come in patients who are post laparotomy, morbidly obese patients. They can have a difficulty in identifying the uh, getting the images. And if the patient has got uh, raised intraabdominal pressures, again, it affects on the validity of the IVC. Suppose so, it is an indicator which probably you use in a setup where you do not have invasive lines or before invasive lines have been put in for a patient. Maybe I may just look at the IVC, say probably IVC is collapsing. Maybe I might give a small fluid bolus and then take a call of how further I need to resuscitate on the patient. Coming on to the passive leg raising, now this is a test which is what is the indicated for most of our ICU patients because it can be used in intubated patients as well as non-intubated patients. It can be used in patients with arrhythmias and it can be used in patients also with low tidal volume. So this has it nullifies all the problems that we have with the pulse pressure variation. But you also need to measure the cardiac output simultaneously, which is done with an esophageal Doppler machine. Suppose you do not have that, you need to learn to measure the cardiac output with your cardiac probe and do with that simultaneously check for the PLR responsiveness. So he's using an esophageal doctor in this, as I mentioned, you look out for aortic blood flow, uh, the change in the blood flow, but at least 10%, it predicts a volume responsiveness. So you, what is important is you need real-time assessment of cardiac output, which means you need to have an invasive monitoring 
which can also be done with the newer system called with the arterial line system called as PICO and LICO, which with an arterial line in place, you can measure this. I have, I have next few slides, which I'll show you those monitors also. Um, the, uh, this is the passive leg raising test. This is how you need to do in this. Basically, the advantage of the passive leg raising is you do not infuse any fluids externally. You're doing an auto transfusion. So for that, what you need to do is first in your bed, you need to keep the patient at 45 degrees semi-recumbent position, which means you allow some amount of venous cooling to occur in the lower limbs. And then after that, you will turn the head, uh, turn the bed to 45 degrees up. And most of our beds right now in the ICUs have these degrees which are marked in the side of the bed if you need. And automatically they have uh, ways how you, instead of just leg raising, you can just tilt the bed like head up and then tilt down to do the passive leg raising right now. So many of you, if you are in an ICU where you're going to prep your beds, you need to definitely have uh, beds which you can easily do the PLR test and you have the degrees marked on them. Uh, so the... In this, the amount of blood which is auto transfused can vary between 150 to 750 ml. And as I told you, PLR can be used in spontaneously breathing patients. And patients can, even if they're having arrhythmia, we can assess the patient because you're working on the principle of auto transfusion and you're seeing if the cardiac output improves with that auto transfusion. So you're not giving externally any fluids. So the damage done to the patient's um, lungs or the heart is much less in this compared to what you would do with external administration of fluid. So this is an auto transmission test that you do on them. Then you see whether the patient is fluid response and if it's fluid responsive, you'll also look if the patient's fluid tolerant to see if there's no increase in the oxygenation. And then you decide on to give it on the fluid boluses. So as I told you, uh, the, uh, the cardiac output measurements can be done either by pulse contour, an contour analysis, which is a special monitoring tool, which uh, you uh, need to attach to your arterial line and or the esophageal Doppler or the transthoracic echocardiogram. So this is the cardiac output monitor, the PICO tool, which PICO and the LICO which is basically, it's uh, it's a flow track kind of device. This is basically attached to an arterial line and you get to know your cardiac output with this. Uh, the advantage of the uh, passive leg is, as I told you, it's a reversible one. Uh, it's easy to perform in patients breathing spontaneously and with arrhythmias, so which is very common in septic ICU patients. Many of them have atrial fibrillation, so it can be the uh, test will not have any fallacy. It can be repeated many number of times to assess preload responsiveness without any risk of inducing pulmonary edema or cord pulmonary edema, so which is a very important uh, thing which we need uh, to know in our many of your septic AKI patients, because many of our septic AKI patients, if there's an obstruction to the urinary system, they might not have urine output. And many a times we are in a uh, um, fit whether we need to give them fluids or we do not, we shouldn't give them fluids. So in such patients, definitely this test has a major advantage. The only disadvantage which I would say is uh, that you... Uh, is in using in patients with raised intra-abdominal pressure because this can vary with these the uh, uh, venous return might vary with this so probably with patients with an acute abdomen the raised intra-abdominal pressure i would not i cannot use a plr test otherwise plr is a best tool to use so we need to learn how to use plr and how to measure the cardiac output either you can have advanced monitoring like the nico system or if you are well trained in the echo you can learn to uh, calculate the cardiac output only with the echo itself and you can calculate. Based on that, we can decide on whether to give fluids or not. So coming on to preload responsiveness, that is if I give a fluid to the patient, whether the patient will be responsive or not. The various tests I have mentioned over here, of which, as I told you, PLR is a test which we will be commonly using. The various tests are just commonly a fluid challenge, which many of us, when a patient comes septic into the ICU with just probably two peripheral lines, the first thing I'll do is just, okay, I'll look at the focus, see if the IVC is dilated or not. Probably if the IVC is collapsing, I'll just say, okay, I'll inform my staff, just give a small fluid bonus. Let's, and if the oxygenation is not an issue, probably I will do this mini fluid challenge test on them. Then the pulse pressure variation and the stroke volume variation. Now, this cannot be more important to remember is it cannot be used in spontaneously breathing patients or low tidal one. So suppose you have a mechanically ventilated patient on whom you want to do the PPP. You need to see that the tidal patient is sedated, paralyzed, patient does not have arrhythmias and you at that point of time, temporarily till you do the PPP test, you need to increase on the tidal volume. Then other tests are the tidal volume challenge test, the end expiratory occlusion test, the IVC 
diameter. The index quickly occlusion is a recent test which they have done, which is can, which again can be used probably in an OT setup where you cannot do the PLR test in those patients. Suppose intraoperatively you want to know whether I need to give fluids or not. This test is used to decide on whether a patient will be fluid responsive or not. Uh, in the ICU, we do not use this test um, because many of your patients can be. Uh, uh, patients who uh, cannot, in, because in this test, you need to see that the patient has a 15 second respiratory hold, which might not be feasible in your septic AKI patient who's on the ventilator and who's got oxygenation issues. Uh, the IVC diameter, which is commonly used, and the SVC diameter, you need to use the uh, trans special echo for that. And the most important, which I think all of you should just, if you all remember the PLR test at the end of my talk, uh, that is the best thing that we can uh, go on. With. I mean, that is the most important test, and we should know the uh, only fallacy of that test is probably you cannot use in patients with raised intra-abdominal pressure. Uh, so coming on to the last point of my talk is about um, echo. How is echo useful in uh, monitoring or hemodynamic monitoring? So any patient who enters into a ICU uh, does not come telling his septic. So uh, if uh, commonest indication for ICU admissions are patient in shock. So first thing I need to know is what type of shock it is, whether it's a distributive shock, whether it's a septic shock, it's a cardiogenic shock, or is it a pulmonary embolism? So my echo is a very useful tool. Within five minutes, I can know the learning curve in echo is very short and uh, it is uh, the inter observer variability is also less in it as if, if you have a good training on that. So a few uh, images I'm going to share on uh, just to tell you what are the images we look at and how we decide on when to give them to it. So uh, this is the four chamber view, which we look at immediately. In this chamber, in this view itself, we can identify if the chambers are dilated. Suppose you have an LV which is grossly dilated. That means probably patient has got some cardiogenic shock possibility. So I might look at the cardiac contractor. Or in this image, if I see an RV significantly dilated, Probably one of the causes, if there is no history of pulmonary hypertension, probably one of the reasons could be a pulmonary embolism itself for the shock. Um, the next one is the IVC that we will look at. Uh, look at the IVC image. And the last one, which we would, uh, which I just want you to, because a lot of intensivists will be talking to you about there's no B-line, so I can go ahead and give fluids. And the nephrologist will say, no, there's no urine output, so why don't you just stop giving fluids? So uh, how is it that we intensivists decide on giving fluids is, and we are confident about handling is this, because we look at two tests majorly, whether the patient is fluid responsive, that is the first thing which I told you, in which we look at uh, the various dynamic measures of uh, fluid responsiveness and to look at whether the patient is fluid tolerant. What is the next ultrasound that we do on these patients is the lung ultrasound. So there are two major profiles that we look at in the lung ultrasound is the A profile and the B profile. So I don't need to wait for my BNP because BNP is going to be elevated in all my septic patients. So it will not make a difference in an AKI patient by just looking at the BNP to decide whether I can give fluids or not. So how I decide or any intensivist decides is look at the lung profile if, if the, even if I've given fluids, if the patient is in got an A profile, that's a normal lung profile in the patients, that is, you will have reverberating lines only up to here. While if you do keep the ultrasound probe on the lung and you see these kind of skyrockets, okay, these, these are called as a B profile. And you need to see more than three and in the anterior part of the lung, if you, uh, this is called as a B profile of the lung. So the moment a patient who is an A profile when have been giving fluids starts having B profile, it is not uh, significant only of pulmonary edema, it can happen even in pneumonia and in ARDS, but there are differentiating features for each one of them. But the moment it goes from A profile to B profile, I'll be very conservative about my fluids. Probably I'll stop loading them with fluids and then I need to think of other ways of improving his hemodynamics like vasopressors, which would have already been initiated on, and I would be conservative on my fluids. And also we look at the oxygenation, but that's a more softer target to look at. The easiest way is to keep monitoring on your lung ultrasound also, along with your cardiac ultrasound, if you think to for a change in from, from the A profile to the B profile. Uh, coming on to the last part of my uh, talk, I would just be talking about the vasopressors. Uh, so, as I told you, in, in the initial part, we have talked about hemodynamic monitoring. I'm just going to just put a small touch on the vasopressors because there are two important things which uh, we need to know is uh, using early vasopressors uh, along with fluid uh, boluses. 
the moment the patient is you load them with fluids when the patient comes with a septic aki shock initially we see if they are fluid tolerant and fluid responsive we load them with fluids after a few boluses of two or three fluid boluses with maintenance fluids if the map does not remain above 70 i'll just come on to this uh, part later on as to why my i am telling a target map of 70 when the guidelines say a target map of 65 um there's a new study on it called as sepsis 65 i'll just talk about it later uh we need to start on the vasopressors among the vasopressors that we have in choice the norepinephrine as the one which is the initial vasopressor that we use and there is a study which is compared norepinephrine versus vasopressin mm -hmm. and in the study you can clearly see that after 4 hours of infusion with vasopressin the uh, creatinine clearance significantly increases so it's not that we start vasopressin early it's just that we need to start in vasopressin early as as the dose of norepinephrine increases beyond probably 0.2 to 0.3 mics per kg at that point of time we start initiating on vasopressin so that the kidneys are not affected by the shock and the hypotension that the patient is going on that next is the sepsis pam study about which saiwan has spoken about about targeting a map of higher versus uh, lower map uh see this in the sepsis pam study though they have said 65 versus 80 most of the patient the higher target were not very on the higher side they were probably maybe 5 70 to 75 so we really do not know will this make a difference in the outcome that is one problem with that study and the other thing probably higher map if you target 85 map it uh, patients can have more of arrhythmias because of the receptor actions on which it acts and more of myocardial infarctions with higher map but uh, when i look at a septic patient with an acute kidney injury probably i would target a higher map of 75 because the uh, incidence of renal re though the mortality benefit is not much uh, the incidence of renal replacement is less in patients whom we have targeted a higher map that's a subset and answer on that so probably when i am asked if a patient with sepsis who's shock who's got renal injury he's got a creatinine borderline 1.3 1.4 and has got a borderline urine output of 10 20 initially he was producing 30 to 40 ml i would probably target a higher map of 70 so understanding the that the chances of probably renal replacement is less in this class of patients but for other patients definitely my target map is now 65 um so the role of how norepinephrine is it increases the cardiac preload it increases the cardiac optimal preload dependent patient and it reduces the degree of preload dependency how does it do basically a noradrenaline uh, causes vasoconstriction so it is similar to fluid infusion that is basically when your vessels are dilated which occurs in septic uh, patients uh, there is lot of uh, the mean systemic filling pressures so by giving a norepinephrine you do vasoconstriction of these vessels and Uh, there is redistribution of the fluid and it increases the preload it also uh, there's that's what there's a redistribution of the fluids from the unstressed to the stressed volume unstressed volume is the volume of fluid which remains in the peripheral circulation which occurs because of the vasodilatation in the septic aki patients so that's why norepinephrine plays a huge role in uh, reducing um, the amount of fluids that we give for this patient also it improves on the renal outcome uh coming on to uh, my last slide uh, basically so what's best for the kidney from macro circulation flow the arterial pressure the cardiac okay. output okay. Now, from the micro circulation point of view vasopressin is preferable because of the uh, preferred vasoconstriction the post glomerular arterial resulting in an increased glomerular filtration the newer drug is which is in the market which is still not available in angiotensin 2 which is uh, used in refractory septic shock uh and uh in the end i would just like to let you a few points is avoidance of nsaid ace inhibitors angioreceptin blockers in uh, septic aki patients and among, as among the fluids which dr saiwani has already told about avoid uh, normal saline preferable to use balanced crystalloid because hyperchloremic acidosis again causes a lot of glomerular injury then the goals of map as i said i if my patient is a septic patient with a renal injury i would probably target a higher map and support uh, uh, to decide on the hemodynamic monitoring tools i would look at a uh, multiple tools together rather than as just one tool so probably i would look at my focus at the heart 
look at the IVC, look at the pulse pressure variation. If I have a feasibility of that, if not that, I will do the PLR test. And to decide on patient if patient is fluid tolerant, I would also look at the lung ultrasound. And uh, finally, adding a low dose of vasopressin. And when your requirement of norepinephrine increases beyond 0.3, makes a huge difference to the outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kavita, for that detailed discussion of basics of hemodynamic circulation to advanced hemodynamic monitoring in sepsis. And we have touched upon renoprotective measures also. Now that we know that hemodynamic resuscitation is an important therapeutic intervention to improve survival in sepsis patients. At the same time, close intensive monitoring of fluid responsiveness is essential to avoid fluid overload, which can further worsen AKA and outcome of these patients. Thank you very much, Dr. Kavita. Thank you, Dr. Kavita, ma'am. Thank you for your uh, valuable lecture. And uh, as we have a short time and we are running out of time, we are not getting any break, break time. Sorry for that inconvenience. And moving down on to the next lecture, that is renal replacement therapy in sepsis AKI. And the speaker is Dr. Kirti Reddy, ma'am. And the moderator is Dr. Uttara Das. Dr. Uttara Das, ma'am, had completed her uh, MBBS, MD, and DNB nephrology and uh, was working as a professor in HOD in the Department of Nephrology and as a dean uh, in All India Institute of Medical Sciences, AIMS MG uh, campus that is in uh, Mangalgiri, Gunto district, Andhra Pradesh, and uh, who had been already worked as an associate and additional professor for uh, faculty for 14 years and in the Department of Nephrology, Nizam Institute of Medical Sciences in Hyderabad. And coming to the short CV about Dr. Kirti Reddy, ma'am. Dr. Kirti, ma'am, had completed her MBBS at KMC Karnool and MD General Medicine at NIMS and DM Nephrology in NIMS and uh, who had a gold medal in Forensic Medicine, Ophthalmology and General Medicine and working as consultant nephrologist in Sri Balaji Hospital, Nandiala and ex-consultant at Sri Sri Holistic Hospital, Nandiala. Thank you and let's start the lecture with... Uh, yeah, very good. Very good morning, everyone. And uh, first, I congratulate Saivani Sai for this. Uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, very much, very congrats. Uh, I, first, I congratulate uh, Dr. Saivani for this uh, very informative and important CME. And, uh, and it is very, uh, for me, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Kitty, who is really a very good uh, uh, student. Uh, and a very good resident and also a very good doctor. Uh, so it's a very proud that she is trained in our institute. So now over to uh, Kirti. And her talk, talk, talk is uh, RRT in sepsis. All the previous uh, Talks are very informative, particularly the Kabita has uh, very uh, nicely explained about the need of uh, fluid management. And uh, I'm sure the Kitty is going to uh, tell details about this RRT in sepsis. Okay, over to Kitty, please. Dr. Kitty? Thank you, Kavita. Please come on. Am I audible? Ah, yeah, you are audible, Dr. Kitty. Please go ahead. Are my slides visible, ma'am? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Thank you, ma'am, for that. Uh introduction and thank you Saivani ma'am for giving me this opportunity. So today I'm speaking about RRT in sepsis AKI. Uh, overview of my presentation is just a brief definition and stages of, a, of AKI and then what are the modalities of treatment of AKI, when do we give AKI, how much should we give and what is the need for AKI especially in septic AKIs, need for RRT that is cytokine, cytokine storm and removal, the guidelines and a brief uh, some few slides on a study we had done in NIMS. Keep it in the slides. 
ऑपरेशन सीटी कीपिटिन कीपिटिन स्लाइड शो एंड लेट द अदर्स टू अनम्यूट आर माय स्लाइड विजिबल मैम इट्स विजिबल मेक इट इट्स स्लाइड शो मैम प्लीज प्रेस एफ फाइव एफ फाइव नाउ हेलो एक्सक्यूज नो यस मैम इट्स आर दे विजिबल हेलो no it's it's a, it is not in slide view i mean the full frame is not coming kirti in yeah, down please right, click it on the in down right you click on that cup shape one i'm doing that it's coming in my screen it is coming full screen but i don't know in, uh, in my screen is uh, it's okay It's okay. I mean, on my screen, I'm getting a full screen, but I don't know why it's not getting shared. Ma'am, please present it again. Please share it again. Okay, now, yeah, pretty carry on. Yeah, yes. coming full screen, ma'am. Okay, okay. Sorry for the delay. So, coming to the introduction of a uh, RRT in AKI. AKI is one of the most common complications, especially for severe psychiatrically ill patients, and many of them require RRT. RRT is the cornerstone of treatment in these patients, and the biggest debate is about the appropriate timing of the AKI. Uh, brief definition it's an abrupt decrease in the kidney function which encompasses both injury structural damage and loss of function the stages of aki the uh, widely used kdgo staging the three stages 1 2 3 they have already been covered then what are the modalities of aki uh, this is the most important part the different modalities of aki uh, one of it is watchful waiting this we do in patients whom we are expecting imminent recovery the others are intermittent hemodialysis done thrice per week uh, this we do in patients who have stable hemodynamics prolonged intermittent hemodialysis done six times per week done again in stable patients sled done three times or six times per week in patients with borderline hemodynamics or unstable hemodynamics the others are continuous modes of dialysis like peritoneal dialysis and crrt this we this is advised in unstable hemodynamic patients and the newer modality that is cytokine adsorption technique done in patients with severe sepsis now what are the changes in septic aki which warrant us and which uh, drive us to think of starting rrt uh, apart from the regular aki complications like hyperkalemia acidosis uremia and fluid overload re uh, resulting in pulmonary edema the incidence of hypotension in septic patients is more common and many of them require the need for inotropes and there is this endothelial dysfunction increased capillary permeability de decreasing the effective circulatory volume and further aggravating the hypotension and there is also the cytokine storm which uh, in this there uh, there is a increase in the cytokine cytokines in the blood and which we think will be removed by rrt the advantages and disadvantages of different modalities of treatment coming to the intermittent hemodialysis there is rapid toxin removal in this uh, because it is done over a period of 4 hours and so it allows time for the other procedures to be done and there is reduced need for anticoagulation that is it is given for only 4 hours the disadvantage of this is some patients they not tolerate this rapid fluid removal and this rapid toxin removal can also cause dialysis disequilibrium the need for treated water 
and ihd cannot be combined with other organ support systems so this is usually done in patients who are hemod hemodynamically stable and who can tolerate these metabolic and fluid fluctuations the next is sled that is slow low efficiency dialysis in this there is a slower volume and solute removal and this uh, there is time for some time for other procedures and investigations that can be done and this also requires lesser or no anticoagulation but the disadvantage with this patient is many of our septic patients are catabolic and this is a highly uh, this procedure has a highly slower toxin removal clearance so it is usually done in hemodynamically unstable patients peritoneal dialysis uh, the advantage is there is, there is no need for vascular access and there are no rapid fluid fluctuations hemodynamics are uh, stable and this is a relatively simple technique and the removal of toxins is gradual uh, disadvantage is inadequate clearance of toxins in these hypercatabolic patients and there is no control over the fluid removal because the peritoneal characteristics are different from patient to patient there is risk for peritonitis in these already septic patients risk for hyperglycemia and since the fluid is introduced into the peritoneum there is a, a respiratory embarrassment so this is usually followed in unstable hemodynamically unstable patients who are at risk for coagulopathy and uh, also in patients with intracranial issues and cerebral edema the other new technique is the continuous renal replacement therapy in this there continuous removal of toxins uh, the hemodynamics are stable and this allows for adequate nutrition there is no uh, restriction of uh, nutrition disadvantages the this is also relatively slow technique though continuous and it requires prolonged anticoagulation and prolonged immobilization and uh, the main advantage of this is it can be coupled with other organ support systems like ecmo so what do we decide and who decides this is an interesting study done in germany and a questionnaire was given to the doctors and it was seen that uh, the decision of rrt and what to be given in most of the icus was taken by anesthetists in 53% of the patients of the cases and 20% uh, of the cases nephrologists were taking the decision now what influences our decision whether to go for the continuous modalities or the intermittent modalities so this is what we know uh, the first graph shows the urea changes with uh, the different modes the light blue line shows the intermittent hemodialysis and the dark blue line shows the crrt so we can see with daily intermittent hemodialysis the urea levels drastically decrease du decrease during dialysis and gradually increase over the next day and then decrease during the next session and so on but in crrt as it is a continuous process though the decrease is not drastic it is slow but it is maintained over a long period the same happens with fluid balance the other important issue of starting rrt in these uh, septic ak patients is the fluid balance now we need to balance uh, the ultra filtration we need to give versus the hypotension and the risk of organ perfusion in these patients so there was a study by done by augustine that is a, uh, comparing the intermittent and continuous dialysis with arf with regard to the fluid balance they found that no there was no significant difference in mortality and renal recovery and also in the icu stay there was a significant drop of map in the intermittent hemodialysis but that was not seen in cvb hdr but the difference was very small that is 77 to 75 this is another study done by winsor et al this also was between intermittent hemodialysis and he continuous veno venous hemodia filtration in critically ill patients this also showed that almost all of the patients can be treated with intermittent hemodialysis so what is the modality we should use there is no definite bp to dictate the rrt choice intermittent hemodialysis can be given in patients who can tolerate metabolic fluctuations and fluid shifts and in whom rehabilitation mobility is a priority crrt can be given in patients who cannot tolerate these fluctuations now uh, in intermittent hemodialysis we have sled so what are, what are the studies between sled and crrt there is one study done by mishra et al in sgpgi and they showed that there was no difference uh, between sled and crrt it is a sled is also a viable modality in patients with septic shock and hemodynamics were similar to crrt another study done to study the cardiovascular tolerability 
between the two methods, LED and uh, CRRT. In this study, 85% of the patients were sepsis. This was done in uh, only 40 patients. But this showed that urea reduction rate was similar in both the groups. And the correction of acidosis was faster with SLED, which was significant. And SLED required lesser amount of anticoagulation. So it requires an individual individualized approach. And the consensus statement is to give the RRT modality, depending on the capability and availability of the technique, its inherited risks and the needs of the patient. Like in the same ICU, different patients might require different modalities. And the same patient, depending on his hemodynamics, will require different modalities at different times. And the next important thing is when should hemodialysis be started? This is the most important research question of recent days. And it's a matter of debate for many years. Till 2016, there were many observational studies and very few randomized controlled trials. Current practice was, current practice is when a patient is volume overloaded with hyperkalemia, acidosis and azotemia, we want to start RRT. But what if all these are not seen but the patient is still oliguric? What if all these are not seen but the uh, creatinine continues to rise? So, we, uh, we always think that starting RRT before major complications happen could have conceivable advantages. What are the theories underpinning this early dialysis? Because it maintains fluid, acid-base balance is maintained better. There's better management of fluids. And uh, regarding the metabolic hazards of these untreated AKA like uremia, gastric hemorrhage. But what is the other end of it? What about the patients who would have survived a recovered function even if RRT was not started? What about the risks of RRT insertion, infection, and hypokalemia? So considering these, some important trials were done. As I've said, before 2016, majority of the trials were observational, other than these two small studies, which were RCTs, done by Baumal et al. and Jamale et al. And both these studies, they were uh, a significant proportion of the patients were septic. And they found that initiating RRT early or late had no difference in the mortality or the renal recovery. Then in 2016, two big randomized control trials were done, the Akiki and the Elaine trial. In the Elaine trial, it was shown that early RRT was associated with a decrease in 90-day mortality. I'll explain it later. And the Akiki trial, it showed that there was no difference in the primary outcome between the early and the late RRT groups. Later down the timeline, the ideal ICU trial was done. In this, 85% of the patients were septic. And the start AKI trial and later the Akiki 2 trial. So this is in brief about the different trials on the early versus delayed strategies. The Aki Akiki trial done in 2016. In this, all the uh, all the patients in KDGO stage 3 were included. The early group, in the early KRT group, these patients in KDGO stage 3 were started on RRT. In the delayed group, patients were wait, uh, RRT was waited till they developed a life-threatening complication or the urea level increased to 240 or the oliguria persisted for about three days after randomization. In the LN trial, the LN trial included patients of KDGO stage 2 and this uh, early divided into the early group and the late group. The early group again initiated dialysis within eight hours of diagnosis of stage 2 AKI and delayed group waited for for 12 hours of reaching stage 3 or any life-threatening complication, urea more than 200 or oliguria. Let's uh, compare the outcomes of these two. In, in the Akiki trial, when most of the patients were septic, the outcome uh, that is survival at 60 days was similar between the both groups and the mortality was not much different, 48.5% and 49.7%. And then this, the important thing is 49% of the patients in the delayed group did not require RRT. And if they were in the early group, they would have been started on RRT. Otherwise, 49% of the patients, RRT could be avoided by delaying the strategy. Complications like, like uh, catheter-related infections were more in the early group, 10% versus 5%. And diuresis, renal recovery or diuresis occurred earlier in the delayed arm. Evaluation of the Elaine trial. In the Elaine trial, most of the patients were surgical patients that is post-cardiac surgeries and post-gastrointestinal surgeries. Mortality at 90 days were lower in the earlier group. RRT freedom, only 9% of the patients in the delayed group did not require RRT. There was no difference in the complications in between the two groups. 
Next was the ideal ICU trial and the start AKI trial. Ideal ICU trial also took rifle stage F equivalent to KDGO stage 3 and early group and late groups. In these also, there was no difference in the mortality between the two arms. And 38% of the patients in the delayed arm avoided RRT. Metabolic complications were more common in the delayed group. And renal recovery was the same in both the groups. Start AKI trial, it was a multinational trial and very large trial including almost 3,000 patients included KDGO stage 2 and 3. In this, there was a standard group and the accelerated group. Accelerated early group where RRT was started early. Standard group where RRT was waited till there were life-threatening complications or till uh, three days post-randomization. In this large study also, the primary outcome was not different in both the groups. And around 40% of the patients could have avoided had avoided RRT by being in the delayed group. Complications were higher in the earlier group and uh, renal recovery continued re uh, need for RRT was higher in the early group, 10% versus 6%. Now, early means how early, late means how late. In Akiki trial, earlier groups, uh, earlier group uh, means that uh, dialysis was started within two hours of randomization, in the LN within six hours and the, and the other two within seven hours. And almost 100% of the patients received RRT in the earlier group. In the later group, Dialysis was delayed. In the LN trial, later group also dialysis was done within 25 hours, but in the rest of the groups, it was done around 50 to 60 hours. And only, uh, in the LN group, 90% of the patients, even in the delayed arm, received RRT, but in the rest, about uh, 40 to 50% of the patients had avoided RRT. What were the life-threatening complications of AKI which needed RRT in these groups? Potassium more than 6 or more than 5.5 despite treatment. Bicarbonate less than 12 or pH less than 7.2 in some studies 7.15. Fluid overloaded or pulmonary edema despite diuretics. Hypoxia, PaO2 by FiO2 less than 200. Or requiring uh, oxygen around 5 liters per minute to maintain saturation around 96%. AKI more than 72 hours. Now, what we have understood from these studies is dialysis can be postponed in a group of patients without life-threatening complications. But how late can they be postponed? To study this, the study group of Akiki had designed another trial, the Akiki 2, to see how late it can be delayed to. This is a visual abstract of the Akiki 2 trial. It was done in 39 ICUs in France. This included all the patients in the delayed group like this, like Kedigo stage 3 plus Oliguria for 3 days. For the, and the blood urea nitrogen more than uh, 112. This was delayed, divided into a delayed group and a more delayed group. More delayed group wherein dialysis was delayed till they developed those life-threatening complications or the urea level increased to around 300 milligrams per deciliter. What were the outcomes? The primary outcome was the RRT free days at day 28. So RRT free days for 12 days in the delayed group and only 10 days in the uh, more delayed group. The secondary outcome was mortality at day 60 and the hazard risk of death at day 60. This was significant and the mortality risk was 44% in the delayed group and 55% in the more delayed group. So, and the RRT or AKI related complications were similar in the both the groups. So, they concluded that in severe AKI patients with oliguria more than 72 hours and a very high blood urea nitrogen with no severe complications, that would mandate RRT. Additional delay in RRT did not confer additional benefit and was associated with potential harm. Because you can see the mortality was more in the more at day 16, more delayed group. Next, how much should be given? How much that is the dosing of RRT that is to be given? Is the more the better? That is usually the norm, the more the better. Yes, the more you practice, the better you get, but not with the intensity of RRT. Theoretically, RRT causes rapid removal of endotoxins and the cytokines. So the pathological immune responses are dampened. So it should hasten and hasten and fasten the recovery. What is it practically? To study these two important landmark trials were the ATN trial and the renal trial. This is about the ATN trial done in 2008. It was a multi center randomized trial done in around 1000 and odd patients. Uh, it was done, uh, they were divided into two groups, intensive group and less intensive group. In intensive group, I, intermittent hemodialysis was done around five times per week and CRRT dose was 35 ml per kg. 
In a less intensive group, hemodialysis was done thrice per week and CRRT doses 22 ml per kg. The primary outcome, that is 60 day mortality, there was no difference. The secondary outcome, the complete and partial renal recovery, also there was no difference. And let's see the complications that is hypotension, hypophosphatemia, and hypokalemia. The hypotension, more patients in the more intensive group required vasopressors. And more patients in the intensive, we had hypophosphatemia and hypokalemia, and these were significant difference. The same was seen in the renal study done the next year in 2009 in 1500 and odd patients. In this, the, it was done only in CRRT. The intermittent hemodialysis was not used in this study. And the dosing in intensive group was 40 ml per kg per hour. In the less intensive, it was 25 ml. Primary outcome seen was a mortality. 28-day 28, 28 mortality, there was no difference. 90-day mortality also, there was no difference. There was no difference in the renal recovery. And let's see the complications. Hypophosphatemia was significantly higher in the intensive group compared to the less intensive group. This is another meta-analysis studying the intensity of renal replacement therapy in AKI by Wang et al. This showed that the short-term mortality apparently was highest in the lower intensive group and the least in the higher intensive group. But let's see the renal recovery rate. But there was no difference in the renal recovery rate, length of hospital stay and the length of ICU stay. This is another meta-analysis of seven randomized control trials done by Ying Wang et al. This also showed that in severe AKI patients, higher intensity AKI does not affect mortality but appears to delay renal recovery. That is, more patients in the higher intensity group remained RRT dependent even at day 28. Now, what is the effect of intensity of RRT on the duration of mechanical ventilation? This was a study done in the chess, published in the chess journal. In this intensive RRT versus uh, less intensive RRT. In intensive RRT, IHD was done either six times per week, sled six times per week, or CVV HDF 35 ml per kg. Less intensive, the uh, CVV HDF was not done, and this intermittent hemodialysis was thrice per week. And they they have seen that there was 33% lower hazard rate of successful extubation. More patients were likely to be intubated in the group receiving intensive RRT. So intensive RRT causes more of hypophosphatemia and has a uh, more uh, more uh, lesser chance of successful extubation and more chances of reintubation. They required longer duration of mechanical ventilation compared to the less intensive RRT. Now a small slide on the cytokine st storm and the cytokine removal. So we know that uh, sepsis causes a cytokine storm and the removal will dampen the pathological process and hazen recovery. Now what is the use of the removal of the cytokine storm? It, dampen, it dampens the excessive response. But is there any harm? Yes. We do not know the, exactly when the excessive pro-inflammatory response is happening. And what happens if the removal is faster than the production? If the removal is faster than the production, then patient is actually exposed to more infection. What do the guidelines say? Uh, These guidelines were of our AKI, RRT in AKI was published in 2012, well before all the randomized control trials were done. And even then they said that RRT should be uh, started emergently only when life-threatening changes were happening. And uh, we should consider not a single test, but a trend in the laboratory test to, when taking a decision to start RRT. And regional anticoagulation is preferred in patients with increased bleeding. Kirti, your phone is muted. Can you hear me now, ma'am? Uh, yeah, but slides are not there. Can I continue like this? But I, because I think it will take time for me to again change. Okay, then. How many slides was left? Finished, ma'am. Almost over. Oh, finished. Okay. So we suggest using CRRT rather than standard hemodialysis in patients who are only hemodynamically unstable, according to the KDGO. And CRRT is a preferred technique in patients with acute brain injury or other causes of raised ICT. 
and the important thing is the dose of rrt that is prescribed should be revised after before each session before each session of rrt and a frequent assessment should be given and the goal should be to maintain the acid base balance uh, the recommended kt by ve is 3.9 per week that is if it is 1.3 per session three times per week it comes to 3.9 per week and if crrt is being given it should be 20 to 25 ml per kg per hour according to the kd goals now there's a there was a small study it's actually a part of the larger aki study done in nims under the guidance of dr rutra so um, this was done in the department of nephrology over a period of one year it included patients with uh, aki stage 3 and uh, other uh, renal allograft patients of aki due to urinary tract obstruction or coincident ckd was were excluded in this study renal recovery complete recovery was defined as a gfr more than 60 partial gfr less than 60 and non recovery gfr less than 15 this was done in about 165 patients with an average age 47 years male to female ratio was 2.47 and you can see that majority of the 56 of the 56% of the uh, cases were septic ak most important uh, site of sepsis around 27% of the patients it was urinary tract and the rest was and the next was the respiratory 22% Average age was 50 years, male to female ratio was 3.1 is to 1, 32% of them were di diabetic. Oliguria was seen in 71% of the patient. Average admission serum creatinine was 6.4. Average WBC count was 14,000. And 41% of the patients had multi-organ dysfunction. 75% of them needed RRT. 8% needed mechanical ventilation. 8% 8 8 8 had in-hospital in mortality and 67% of them had complete recovery at discharge. This is a slide showing the outcome of all these patients. At three months, at discharge, 8%, there were 91% surviving, 62% had complete recovery, 5% had non-recovery, and 3% were HD dependent. At six months, the death rate increased to 20%, 78% uh, of them were surviving, 87% of the surviving patient had complete recovery, 2.5% had progressed to CKD. And uh, all of the HD dependent patient had expired by three, six months. At 24 months, the death rate had increased to 24%, 75% of them were surviving. Of the surviving percent, patients, 88% had complete recovery, 9.3% had partial recovery, and 2.6% progressed to CKD. So summary of this small study was UTI was the most common cause of septic KKI followed by respiratory tract. Multi-organ dysfunction was seen in 40% patients. RRT was needed in 75% of the patients. And at, at discharge, 70% of the patient recovered. At 24 months, survival rate was only 76%, of which 88% had complete recovery and 2.5% of them progressed to CKD. So conclusion of this is, uh, of this talk is, we need an individualized approach uh, for each patient, be it intermittent hemodialysis or SLED or CRRT. Uh, RRT should be started emergently in cases with life-threatening changes. There is no definite cutoff of BP or GFR for initiating RRT. High-intensity RRT, there is no definite difference. Three times per week of IHD is sufficient. And uh, regarding the timing of RRT, in, even in the by following the delay strategy, significant number of patients can escape RRT. Finally, it is a clinician's de uh, decision at bedside based on the resources and patient's response to treatment to guide the choice. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kitty. It was a very uh, nice presentation and I'm very glad to hear you from after, I think, three, four years. Uh, you always present uh, very precisely and to the point. So I'm very happy. And uh, yeah, this is always depends on the clinician choice. As you rightly said, it has to be individualized. What, what is available now? I am in Mangalagiri. Nothing is available. I can able to do so many uh, AKI with five, six creatinine without much renal replacement therapy. Whereas I would have been NIMS with even in two creatinine. We sometimes start dialysis. So it all depends on where you are, what you, where you are practicing. So other than unless we will have a very good randomized control trial. The answer of which modality is best, when to start, where to start is still questionable. So your presentation is very nice. So thank you very much. And thank you 
organizer for giving us this opportunity to be here today. And thank you very much. Good thank day. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the great lecture. And I'd like to. What has happened? Has Lata gone again? Lata, are you there? Manisha, you are looking very pretty. <laughs> you always compliment whatever. So <laughs> nice. Very nice. Yeah, you are also an inspiration. I'm very happy to see you actually. You are like glowing, no? <laughs> okay, okay. You are my fitness model, I think, Puttara. You, you put me on the right track. To okay, be okay. Thank you. Right. So I guess we will uh, proceed with the meeting. And at the outset, I would like to congratulate the AP Win chapter. Excellent job. And within such a short span of time of the inauguration of the chapter, you are, lo and behold, you have come out with a great conference. So congratulations, Saiwani. Congratulations, Jiki, ma'am, and all of you. I'm really so proud. And the lectures have been fantastic. AKI, we keep on hearing all the time, but the septic AKI, which Saiwani has chosen, is very relevant to the practicing nephrologists as well as to the postgraduates as well. And uh, all the topics were very, very well presented. The nephro presentation as well as the anesthesia presentation was simply wonderful. Now, coming to this next talk, uh, this is by... Uh, Dr. Shiva Parvati, I mean, uh, not uh, not an unknown name to all of us. Wonderful speaker, wonderful orator, and quiz queen, if I can call her that. She is MD from Andhra Medical College, Baiza. Uh, she is DM Nephrology from Nizam's Institute of Medical Sciences and has also done her DNB as well. She worked as assistant professor at Swims Tirpati from 2018 to 2020. And currently, she is working as consultant at Amar Hospital, Tirupati. Not only that, she is also uh, associated with Pranavi Super Specialist uh, Super Speciality Clinics. So, I mean, I have been uh, hearing her lectures, and I'm really a great fan of hers. The way she presents. So, over to you. The floor is yours, Dr. Shiva Parvati. And thank you again for this opportunity. The topic she'll be talking about is a continuation of the previous one: role of CRRT in sepsis. And I'm sure she'll do justice to the topic. Over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. I'm very happy uh, uh, to give a small experience, to share my experience on CRRT in such as AKI patients in front of all of my teachers, seniors and friends. Ma'am, uh, one second, ma'am. I would like to take a minute uh, uh, to give a brief description about Dr. Manisha Sahai, ma'am. You are back. So sorry, we have to start without you because somehow your uh, thing okay, got Lata, muted. Lata, uh, Manisha Sahai, madam, doesn't need any introduction. She is my teacher, mentor, and all, and she is the great support behind but me. But I'd like to give an introduction about Manisha Sahai, ma'am. And Manisha Sahai, ma'am, who is uh, working as professor and HOD at nephrology at Usmania Medical College, Hyderabad, and her achievements. Uh, she is an editor in chief of Indian Journal of Transplantation, deputy chair CME Committee, International Society of Nephrology, vice president in Women in Nephrology, and the president of the Hyderabad Nephrology Forum, and a fellow academy of uh, uh, fellow of Me Academy of Medical Sciences, and executive committee member of Indian Society of Organ Transplant Examiner (MRCP), and uh, had received 13 gold medals and 167 publications, and more had given more than 500 guest lectures, and uh, awarded as a uh, Awarded on Doctor's Day Award from IMA Hyderabad and the Doctor's Day Distinguished Services Award from uh, Arogya Street Trust and the Vice President of Indian Society of Nephrology and a member of many societies and a member of uh, Indian Society of Dia uh, Dialysis, Hemodialysis and the Council Member of Indian Society of Nephrology and a Chair South Asia Regional Board member. And this is my privilege to introduce Dr. Manisha Sahayama and thank you for giving this opportunity. Thank you, thank you, Lata. Over to you, uh, Siva Parvati. Please proceed with your lecture. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Om Namo Venkatesaya. Uh, I'm coming from Tirupati today, and I will be talking about uh, So this is a brief review. So we will be seeing about the cellular dynamics in AI, and uh, what are the various indications and contraindications of CRRT. And the technical aspects of CRRT and uh, at the end I would like to share my experience with CRRT and conclusions. So 
so let us all play some quiz after listening so many lectures we are all uh, hectic with the knowledge so can anyone identify this personality amongst the group it is for us all the participants can participate of course i don't have gifts i thought of bringing the gift but i cannot give because it's a virtual session anyone shall i go ahead with the answer i think i have some answers in the chat how do you differentiate uremic cardiomyopathy versus septic cardiomyopathy okay uh, so can anyone guess the personality am i audible ஒரு <laughs> Uh, madam no ma'am it is not jan kalam fine so no, but, now you only have okay. to tell the answer then uh okay ma'am uh next slide on excuse yeah so he is hans krebs the krebs cycle uh, inventor because day in and day out as a nephrologist we will be talking about urea so this is the man who has uh, delineated what exactly happens to urea in our body and i thought it is relevant for us to know uh, the urea generation kinetics of course i'm not going to explain in detail about the urea generation so hats up to this personality so what is the importance in relevance to acute kidney injury in ak patients the most important thing that we should understand is they are very very catabolic patients they will have a very high protein catabolism and this leads to increased urea generation which cannot be reduced with dietary protein restriction unlike in ckd so here i am i am trying to bring out the point that intermittent renal replacement therapies are apt for patients with chronic kidney disease because their urea generations are stable and we can to some extent control their urea generations by asking them to be strictly compliant with dietary restriction of protein but the contrary with ak patients in ak patients neither the patients are feeding by themselves because most of them are in icu most of them will be on a rise to mechanical ventilatory support so we cannot exactly identify their intake so that we have to restrict instead patients with ak we tell them to give high protein diet because they are highly protein catabolic and this is single point that we should drive out and we should understand in every patient that the continuous modalities are going to play a role in this particular point that is the continuous protein catabolism that is happening in aki patients can be dealt uh, to a greater extent in continuous therapies when compared to intermittent therapies so next this one couples after seeing this i i am really surprised because being couples also we can make so many great inventions shiva can anyone answer shiva pa you you ma yourself you you only give the answers ma at least i can okay. <laughs> thank you okay ma i see uh, so they are the cori couple so fernando cori and jetty cori and they have identified this cori cycle that is cori cori cycle if you see this this is very important because all the septic patients they are most probably in hypotension so we don't have a separate uh, thing like it is only sepsis aki this is only ischemic aki most of the times the patients are having multiple complications so they will be in ischemic uh, sepsis patients as we have seen there is vasodilatation and hypotension so whenever there is hypotension the the muscles will be releasing lots and lots of lactate uh, excuse me so this lactate what happens this is taken up by the liver and this is again converted to glucose which can be used by this muscle tissue so this is a another basic biochemical principle that we need to understand in septic patients or in all patients with acute kidney injury that they are going to produce lots and lots of lactate and if they also have mods that is multi organ dysfunction this lactate uh, conversion to glucose is also very less in these patients 
So hyperlactatemia is also, and the removal of lactate with hemodialysis is very, very negligible. And it, it, it is not even complete with continuous therapies, but continuous therapies are going to fare better when compared to the intermittent therapies if you think about the lactate clearance and most of the times in ICU, when we see that the patient is having severe lactic acidosis, what to be done with this? Apart from the correcting the underlying cause that is responsible for this increased lactate levels, that is tissue hypoxia or any organ dysfunction, we need to think about its clearance also. So these are the two basic underlying biochemical principles that favor continuous therapies than intermittent therapies in patients of acute kidney injury. So uh, this I have explained, MOTS with liver injury is often a common companion in which there is very high lactate production, clearance of which is minimal with HD. And in hemodynamically unstable patients, this may further aggravate the hemodynamic. Suppose if the patient is hemodynamically unstable and if we subject them to intermittent therapies, where we are going to remove a lot of fluid in a short span of time, this may further aggravate hypoxia as well as hypotension, and this may further elevate the lactate levels. So next one, this is uh, uh, another great person who has revolutionized the cancer uh, treatment as well as cancer physiology. This is called as the Warburg effect. So this is another important biochemical. See, normally, if the tissues are rich in oxygen, they go and do oxidative phosphorylation in mitochondria, which gives 36 millimoles of ATP for, for 1 ml of glucose. But if there is no oxygen, the tissues utilize the phosphopentose pathway that is and they give lactate they give rise to lactate this is called as anaerobic glycolysis but what happens in tumor cells or in acute kidney injury also because in tumor cells in even in the presence of oxygen they use this aerobic glycolysis but what happens in acute kidney injury in acute kidney injury there will be a lot of damage to the mitochondria so this might have because of this mitochondrial damage the tissues cannot go undergo oxidative phosphorylation and they will undergo this pyruvate phosphate pentose pathway and they release lots and lots of lactate. So this Warburg effect is also being recently studied in acute kidney injury patients, in patients with ATN to stop this effect so that with a mitochondria can be effectively regenerated and ATN process can be stopped also. So all these things is why continuous uh, modalities of renal replacement therapy are gaining the momentum is because lot and lot of research is going uh, into the cellular level, into the molecular level of mechanisms of acute kidney injury. And that is why we are, uh, means we are more and more utilizing this continuous renal replacement therapies whenever they are available with us. So this is important. And one more thing is, based on this Warbur effect only, because of in addition to the anaerobic uh, energy production, the aerobic glycolysis, and the resulting metabolites, they are also involved in the regulation of various pathophysiological processes, such as cellular proliferation, extracellular matrix production, autophagy, and apoptosis. This is important because once the patient has an AKI, we are also thinking about, as a nephrologist, we are very much worried in the short-term outcomes to bring the patient out of this acute kidney injury. And also nowadays, a lot of importance is given to the prevention of CKD that happens after an acute kidney injury event. So this, if the patient is using more and more of aerobic glycolysis, they are going to have more and more tissue proliferation. This tissue proliferation in the long term will be converted to fibrosis and there will be more progression to CKD. So when you apply continuous replacement therapies in acute kidney injury patient, it is not only that you are, under, you are correcting the underlying abnormalities, but also you are preventing the progression of acute kidney injury to the chronic kidney disease. So this part is also being addressed with this continuous renal replacement therapies. So with this, we have come to the important topic of molecular reprogramming and relevance in AKA and its impact on modality selection. Why I have taken this few slides on this molecular reprogramming is, this is the basis, underlying biochemical, pathological and physiological basis of modality selection. That is, we are translating the bench research into the bedside research. That's so now we are very much sure. That means all of us are convinced that continuous therapies do play an important role because if they are available with us, because they are going to address the continuous urea generation that is going to take place and high catabolic rate that is going to take place in AKI patients. And similarly, they are going to remove higher lactate levels, which are very much higher in 
sepsis patients, which is very much difficult in intermittent therapies. And the third and most important is these continuous therapies are going to address the molecular reprogramming that is happening in these cells and they will prevent the conversion or the progression of an acute kidney injury to the chronic kidney disease in near future. And also we have the four stages of acute kidney injury that is initiation phase, maintenance phase, recovery phase. And now they have identified an extension phase. That means once uh, that is the chronic phase, once this acute kidney injury has happened, there's an extension of the initial phase at this particular point. That means in the initiation and extension phase, if we could apply our continuous therapies, we can make the recovery also very faster. So as we have seen, there are a lot of things uh, after ischemia, in sepsis, if you see this slide, I don't want to remember all these things, but there are multiple mechanisms. There are a lot of enzymes getting activated. There is a lot of free radicals that are going to be released. And all these things are going to be, all these things are going to be addressed by the renal replacement therapy that we are going to give apart from the treatment of the definitive cause that is antibiotic therapy. So based on this uh, cellular pathobiology, an ideal renal replacement therapy should be how? How should it be means? It should avoid hypoxia, it should avoid hypoglycemia, it should avoid hypotension, and it should be able to continuously remove the inflammatory mediators, both by dialysis, ultrafiltration, as well as adsorptive techniques. So we can achieve these things at least with the present technology of the continuous renal replacement therapies to 70 to 80 percent. I'm not telling you with the CRRT also we can do 100 percent of these things, at least when compared to intermittent therapies, we can avoid hypotension, hypoglycemia, hypoxemia with the continuous therapies. So with this, we come to a, a borderline conclusion that if you have the availability and if you have the patient also affordable with the procedures that we are able to do, the modality of choice at present in patients with AKI and sepsis is CRRT. So what are the various indications for continuous renal replacement therapy? As we have seen, they're all similar to other uh, conventional techniques, but the one more important thing that I want to stress here is the volume overload, yes, metabolic acidosis, electrolyte abnormalities, hyperkalemia, and hyponatremia. If you see, hyperkalemia is best corrected with hemodialysis. If the patient is hemodynamically stable, the rate of removal of potassium with the hemodialysis is much better than CRRT. So in that case, we do prefer HD. But hyponatremia, in hyponatremia, the removal with CRRT is better when compared to HD. And hyperphosphatemia, as we have seen in the previous speaker also, in continuous modalities, there is a more chance of hypophosphatemia than intermittent modality. So if the patient is having hyperphosphatemia also, we prefer continuous modalities. And the other indications are uremic encephalopathy, pericarded. This last single indication is very, very important because regularly in the ICUs, I don't find uh, hard indications for hemodialysis or uh, renal replacement, that, but there is persistent and progressive acute kidney injury. That means the serum creatinine is not going to come down, but the urea levels are going to daily increase over time, but the patient will not be having severe volume overload, neither severe metabolic acidosis. So this particular indication that is either persistent or progressive acute kidney injury is nowadays coming up as an important indication because we have to adjust the internal milieu. So continuous renal replacement therapy is a standard of care for the management of critical ill patients with acute renal failure. So CRRT is indicated in patients who meet the criteria for hemodialysis therapy, but who cannot tolerate conventional intermittent hemodialysis because of hemodynamic instability. This particular statement, I wanted to reiterate because even my previous speaker told that patients, if they are hemodynamically unstable, go for CRRT. But please try to understand that it is not only hemodynamic instability. If you have the procedure with you, the CR continuous therapies are much better. As we understood, there are other indications also. As we have understood, they are going to attack the underlying biochemical processes also. And this CRRT is going to rebuild the body's immune function also by using inflammatory mediators to control the patient's systemic response and achieve a therapeutic goal. So how we go about, if you see a patient with severe sepsis or septic shock uh, with kidney injury and without kidney injury. If there is a kidney injury, uh, we have uh, so many conditions like oliguria, fluid overload, metabolic acidosis, hyperkalemia, and serum creatinine. We have to go for a conventional blood purification therapies or CRRT where we use CVVHD and CVVHDF. I, I most often use CVVHDF because 
the type of patients that we see in ICU is, uh, this is from my personal experience, usually initially they will present with pre-renal ARF. The ICU team, they start giving more and more of IV fluids. Uh, as Kavita Madam told, you know, the daily monitoring of the fluid status is not being done in majority of the, means uh, it is not a protocol that we are going to address fluid daily. If the patient is uh, improving with urine output, we have to go and de-escalate the fluid also. See, after uh, means after coming out of my post graduation days, where you now I where now I work, it is a corporate hospital with uh, multiple ICU patients, polytrauma patients, cardiac patients. There, I see more and more of critical ill patients. One day they will call me. I'll give fluid therapy. The second day, patient's creatinine will come down. So, uh, madam, there is no need for madam consultation. But again, after two days, I will get a call. Madam, patient is in fluid over because they are continuing the fluids that are given in the first day only. They are not uh, changing the fluid therapy. So, this we have to educate our ICU team. Then I understand that there is some problem with this. So, then I told them fluids have to be decided every day. So, uh, as we, uh, as madam has already discussed based upon the ultrasound and everything, actually, to me, Every physician or every anesthetist or every nephrologist or any clinician, remembering these four phases of fluid therapy are very, very important because wherever we work, fluid bolus, we don't think of anything. We just give fluid bolus. Once the patient is out of the emergency, we have to give, uh, we have to see for the fluid challenge, whether he is requiring it or not. After that, if the patient is on maintenance fluids, it is our duty at least every 24 hours to see and de-escalate the fluid. So fluid de-escalation is playing a main role in the ICUs nowadays because the most common indication for starting the dialysis, either intermittent hemodialysis or continuous therapies is the fluid overload. So how to prevent this fluid overload? That is to address to the fluid needs of the patients daily to assess them on a daily basis. And sometimes we have to start the continuous therapies even in patients without kidney injury. So th those are the patients with endotoxemia or with patients with cytokine storm. So we have seen the COVID pandemic and uh, most of uh, the seniors here would have a lot of experience with the uh, CRRTs in COVID patients without renal failure also, where, where they have taken the IL-6 levels and endotoxin levels into account and they started doing the uh, continuous therapies in cytokine storm patients. <coughs> So this uh, one particular uh, study that I have seen, the uh, I thought it is uh, better to discuss about this. Here they have seen that <coughs> CRRT can effectively improve the condition of patients with sepsis and AKI because by promoting the elimination of toxins, what they have done is see, they have divided the patients into two groups. Uh, so the first group is without uh, CRRT and the second group is with CRRT. If you see the clearance rates in the first group, uh, excuse me. Oh, sorry. So in the first group, uh, uh, I don't know whether you are able to see it or not. I'm not able to point. Uh. So the serum creatinine clearance, lactate clearance, and urea nitrogen clearance in the second group are very much higher. And if you see the HSCRP levels and TNF alpha levels also, they are very much uh, better removed in, in uh, continuous renal replacement therapies compared to the intermittent uh, hemodialysis as well as the Apache scores and SOFA scores also, they are, uh, they are much better and they have seen the deaths within 28 days also. The patients who have undergone continuous therapy fared better when compared to the patients who have undergone intermittent therapies. So another condition that is AK in COVID. Uh, so there are multiple mechanisms of acute kidney injury in COVID patients. The one is cytokine storm, other is infection, that is pneumonia. The third is a hypercoagulability causing the underfilling and causing venous condition. So in these patients also, CRRT plays an important role. But if you go for guidelines and if you go for evidence, I think ET has covered almost all the trials, ELAIN trial, Kiki trial, all these trials at present, if you ask, the evidence for the treatments is limited. But in the absence of established treatment options for COVID-19, there is a pathophysiological rationale to support use of high cutoff, medium cutoff membranes in CVVHT to increase the cytokine removal. And also in the early phase of cytokine storm, the application of hemoperfusion with sorbent cartridges, that would be in the next uh, talk we will be seeing. So these treatments have saved many lives during the pandemic. And these are indicated in special cases where immunodysregulation is evident, like 
we have uh, measured the CRP levels, procalcitonin levels, IL-6. When you see this immunoregulation in the... <clears throat> The previous slides also give the answer at what time should we give if the removal is more than production. So you should document the immunodysregulation. It is possible nowadays. And uh, inflammatory parameters and cytokines can be measured. Of course, most of these, uh, the literature that is coming from West, they are being done on a trial basis. In India, we did not do this in trial basis, but we have tried on majority of the patients during the emergency, and most of the results are successful. And I request uh, with this platform our seniors to present uh, whatever or share their experience with the uh, continuous therapies in these patients with cytokine storm and other supportive therapies if they, uh, they are failing or if the treatment is insufficient. Uh, this is also one of the study that is published by the Claude Ronco, where he, uh, the final uh, conclusion that he gives is extracorporeal treatments do not compromise the experimental antibody-based therapies used in COVID-19. That means, as I have been telling from the beginning, even in sepsis, these extracorporeal therapies, they do not replace the definitive antibiotic treatment. Similarly, here also in covid they do not replace or they do not compromise the antibody-based therapies used in COVID-19, that is tocilizumab, IV and convalescent plasma. But neither hemodialysis filters nor hematrogen cartridges remove antibodies. This is very important uh, because that size is only 150 kilodaltons per IgG, far exceeds the upper size of molecules that can be removed with either RRT or hemadsorption. But in CRRT, with the help of CVVHF or CVVHTF, we can remove the molecules of larger sizes also. So coming to the AKA in children and the role of CRRT, definitely in children, uh, I think uh, uh, submitting the children to HD because, uh, because uh, the body Man, surface is very high and uh, there, uh, if even the chances of more interdialytic hypotensions are very high with children and most of the times we do not have the adequate uh, lines and we do not have the adequate uh, dialysis as well as with these children and if available, even CRRTs, they play an important role in children also. So it is very common in critical ill children to prevent and recover from AK optimization. Most of the times in children, CRRTs are being done for optimization of volume status and to prevent nephrotoxic agents and sometimes to provide sufficient nutritional support is also very, very important in children with AK because it is going to hamper their growth and nutrition. At that time, to promote the nutrition also, CRRT is an important modality that we need to consider. So it is continues to be increasingly performed for treating severe AKI patients. Of course, I did not have an experience of uh, treating children with AKI till now. <clears throat> and one more uh, a word on the post hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. There are various mechanisms of AKI, but these patients sometimes do present with sepsis. And in these patients also, CRRT plays an important role in the post hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. I had an experience of only one patient during my internship. Uh, when uh, they have uh, undergone bone marrow transplantation and they have this uh, sepsis causing acute kidney injury in a child and we have done CRRT to that patient and uh, the child has come out very well. Uh, at that time, the patient's hemodynamics are not unstable. See, this is very, very important to understand. You need not to wait for the hemodynamics to be unstable to start CRRT. That is the important point that I want to drive in today. If the patient, there is a specific indication, like there is cytokine storm, there is a hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, post um, sepsis is there, where you think that removal of toxins on a continuous basis is far better than intermittent therapies, you can still consider CRRT, even if the hemodynamics are stable. So the rationale for use of CRRT in sepsis is mostly centered around its potential for mitigating volume overload that often accompanies the hemodynamic support during sepsis and its priority role for clearing sepsis associated inflammatory cytokines because in sepsis as i told you we dump in lots and lots of fluids so again we see a patient with a fluid overload so that patient's volume optimization is most comfortable with crrt i don't say that it is 100 percent perfect with crrt but volume optimization is going to be comfortable with crrt when compared to the intermittent therapies and in this regard, there is developing interest in the use of membranes designed for hydrophobic adsorption also. There are a lot of changes that are happening even in the CRRT filters nowadays where they are going to apply these adsorption filters also. 
So this is an article that I have read. Uh, even here, article can be used in post lung transplant cases also. Even in these patients also, because most of them are on ventilator support, and it is used for cardiac optimization. So uh, coming to my my own experience of uh, renal replacement therapy, this is the uh, my own thesis that I have done in NIMS, uh, where I have uh, studied on the acute renal intensity, acute renal care unit admissions. This is only part of the thesis where I have seen the influence of modality of renal replacement therapy and mortality among patients in intensive care unit. So in that, the total number of patients were 118 and uh, improved patients are 111 and expired are 78. I have seen Compared with hemodialysis, intermittent peritoneal dialysis, SLED, and CRRT, but the number of CRRT patients in this study is very, very small. So I cannot com completely comment on that. Uh, this was the observation. There was a significant association between use of any mode of dialysis and without using dialysis. That means patients who required dialysis uh, had a higher chance of mortality when compared to patients who did not require. Of course, in my study, I found that Patients who are on IPD, they have a higher mortality when compared to HD and SLED because in our uh, institute, uh, whenever if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, first we start them on IPD. So if CRRT is available and patients are affordable because the affordability issues the, in institutions, most of the time we start on IPD and uh, that's why the mortality is very high in patients with IPD. And coming to the CRRT experience uh, that I have done in the last one year, we have done 10 cases of CRRT at this hospital. Uh, CRRT for sepsis has been done in five patients and one patient has recovered and CRRT for traumatic injury, traumatic brain injury. I did not touch upon traumatic brain injury and cardiac uh, resuscitation because that is, we are here, we are discussing only on sepsis part. I have done for one patient of cerebral edema. This is very important, especially in sepsis and morts. The two patients also will have some uh, global hypoxia and cerebral edema. In that patients also, CRRT plays a very good role. And CRRT post CT surgery, he also has recovered. And CRRT for post cardiac intervention, post PTCA patients for cardiac uh, volume stabilization, also we have done, but the two patients have expired. Coming to the sepsis patients, if you see that the average uh, age is around 50 to 75 patients, yeah, 75 range. And uh, I have done three patients, uh, COVID pneumonia patients only. The one patient is for cellulitis of right leg with AKI. And the fifth patient is for acute pyelonephritis with septic shock. And if you see, the starting BP for almost all of the patients is 80, 50, 90, 60. And all of them have expired. Only one patient, I started him, even the blood pressure is 130 by 90. Because his uh, cellulitis is so severe, I have seen that the surgeon has uh, uh, debrided the wound I saw with my eyes. I thought there are a lot of mediators, inflammatory mediators are going to be in this patient. And uh, see, the cyanotrope support is also nil. And the mean duration that we have done for this particular patient is only 24 hours. And the important lesson that I learned from this patient is he has complete recovery of AK and his creatinine has come down from 4.7 to 0 0.8. After this, uh, means I did not see such faster recovery of AKI when I have uh, put the patients on hemodialysis because I do them four or five sessions. I discharge them again. They come to follow up after a week because most of the times I see a lot of snake bite with AKIs in this particular area. So they require dialysis for a week or two and they come back after two weeks and then their creatinine normalizes. Even in cellulitis patients, who are put on HD, their average duration will be two to three weeks. But surprisingly, this patient, his duration was only for two days and has complete recovery. Then I understood. Now I, I changed my protocol in my institute. It is not that I will wait till the BP falls 80, 60 or 90, 60, even with good hemodynamics. If I think that this patient has a underlying pathology or an underlying molecular biology that is going to be benefited with continuous therapies. And if the patients are affordable, then I start CRRT. Uh, and uh, even in COVID also, then uh, all the anesthetists would refer to me only if the patient is on ventilator, requiring high flow oxygen, BP not recordable, post-cardiac status, then they should use to call me because that was their conception of CRRT. CRRT means hemodynamically unstable patients only. Later, I just, I went there, I told them it is not like that. We can start even in early phases also. They are having more of cytokine storm. In that cases, they are useful. Now, they started uh, referring for these, uh, you know, even in hemodynamical stable patients also. Hopefully, I may uh, come up with a good outcomes in CRRT patients in future because I'm also learning. 
uh and uh, so the last patient is also acute pyelonephritis with septic shock but she has come in severe shock condition with very high lactates this last patient i remember her lactates are around some 60 80 like that we just kept her within less than 24 hours within 6 hours only she has expired so we should not wait till the lactate start building up lactate raising is an early feature that we should start these continuous modalities uh, at the earliest to the patient but there is one more thing to this uh, crrts so ai is reaching everywhere now and uh, soon it is going to enter into our practice also i don't know whether it's going to replace us and i don't want it to be so this is the crrt in future uh, which ronco has uh, imagined and he wants it to be where in uh, now crrt if we start the crrt we have to be with it and we have to monitor for electrolyte abnormalities hypokalemia hypophosphatemia hypocalcemia all these things we have to monitor every 4 to 6 hours depending upon the patient's response but now they are designing that they will have a adaptive control that is online hdf like how we are doing online hdf but online hdf is only automatic volume control here they have uh, they are going to design uh blood pressure control heart rate ekg stroke volume blood volume thermal balance everything the machine is going to give a signal and the signal is being processed it is controlled and it is going to correct the things on its own on the machine so how is it going to be we don't know we have to see maybe uh this is going to be the near future his decisions aren't any better than yours but they are way faster so they are not better than us controlling them and finally i just wanted to uh, show the slide uh, this is from the greek mythology where hydra is a serpent uh, a monster which is having multiple heads hercules was given the task to kill it how can we kill it so here nephrologist is like a herculean task see in the sepsis in the aki there are multiple mechanisms of aki so we have to address all of them at a time we have to address the hypotension part we have to address the hypoxia part we have to address the cytokine storm storm part so all these things has to be addressed with a single modality that is very impossible but to a smaller extent continuous therapies help us to correct almost all the abnormalities but we have complex patients in therapy the question the take home message is in a given clinical situation with a given patient with a specific that is septic internal view cr hold a position in alleviating the cause of renal failure as i told you it's not going to give more and more hypoxia and hypotension and it supports the renal failure and the most important part is it prevents the progression of aki to akd and ckd and this needs to be individualized as we have seen the guidelines are only for guidance and each and every patient is different and my request is you see the patient's internal milieu look at the patient and just look at his internal milieu it is not the hemodynamics alone that decide the continuous modalities a uh, thank you and uh, now i welcome suggestions from my seniors uh, thank you ma'am manisha ma'am yeah so thank you uh, shiva parvati that was an excellent uh, presentation and you have highlighted that crrt is more for maintaining the internal milieu and we should not keep on waiting and that tag that it should be used only in hemodynamically unstable patients is wrong that you have effectively Uh, shown uh, my take on this is we as nephrologists have different tools available to us we should use them judiciously and with our conscience guidelines will always be there mm -hmm. guidelines are guidelines and um, if you are in a debate you will have multiple guidelines a speaker on pd will show all the positive points of pd show those studies the speaker on hemodialysis would do the same a sled yes again same and crrt again same so yes we should know the positive and negative points of all the modalities we should not be against we should not have a fixed mindset the older nephros against crrt the younger ones all going for crrt no we are nephrologists first we are humans first and mm -hmm. i think the decision should be based on the overall presentation situation scientific as well as the social circumstance we should practice the science and art of medicine that's my take on it and i am not against crrt i would definitely like to provide crrt even if the patient is hemodynamically stable in case it's a very hypermetabolic type of aki hypercatabolic aki you have a lot of cytokine storm yes but my plea is that you want to start on crrt and you can provide crrt only for one day and after that the patient can't afford it 
then take a wise decision. The art of medicine takes precedence over the science of medicine. So that's my only message, but great talk, Shiva Parvati. The students mm -hmm. should learn, all old, new students, everyone are in the process of learning and we should learn that CRRT also is another tool in our armamentarium. So I don't know, I would like to ask the organizers, I mean, if um, we can take any questions or that would be at the end of uh, the webinar. Madam, another one talk is there with Sai Swapna on sure. cytokine adsorption. After that, we'll go ahead with the... Sure. So excellent, uh, Siva Parvati. Thank, Thank you, you very much for a nice presentation. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Next, we move on to next lecture by Sai Swapna. And thank, and, uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the CRRT in SHSAK lecture. It was a great lecture. And the next topic is Cytokine Adsorption Therapy in SHSAK by Dr. Sai Swapna Atluri. And the moderator is Dr. Swarnalata. And uh, coming to a brief CV about Dr. Swarnalata, ma'am. Uh, she had done her MD, DM at uh, NIMS and uh, additional professor in, in Department of Nephrology, NIMS Hyderabad and Telangana. And uh, she had a 17 years experience in clinical nephrology, dialysis and transplantation. And she had uh, participated in many training programs and she was awarded with many awards uh, as a tanker award in uh, ESNC uh, 2007 and uh, the Transplant Society 2012 Germany awards and uh, had uh, done uh, more than 70 publications and editor of human, ma human hemodialysis manual and associate editor of postgraduate nephrology book and the author of many books and uh, with a great career. And coming to the introduction as a uh, Swarnalata man is not available because of some network issues. I'm introducing. Yeah, yeah. I'm very much here, uh, uh, Saiwani. Lata, madam is available. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm very much okay. here, Saiwani. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, uh, good afternoon. It's a very wonderful session. I think it's, I mean, the woman in nephrology, Andhra chapter has to be appreciated. They have done a very good job in selecting a very relevant topic and covering right from the basics, understandings of pathophysiology to a now an advanced therapy. So as the various speakers have said, we have understood the, you know, cellular and molecular mechanisms that has led to the advancement in the therapeutics. And I think we are coming to the last topic of today, that is the cytokine adsorption therapy in AKI. And uh, for this, I would like to invite the, our speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Swapna. Dr. Swapna, I think she is uh, from, uh, she has done her MBBS from Siddhartha Medical College, uh, the America, to pursue her uh, general medicine in uh, American Board, followed by her uh, DM Nephrology, again from the American Board, and she has come back in 2017, I believe, to, uh, to Hyderabad, uh, to uh, Vijayawada. And she has been doing as one of the uh, leading uh, nephrologist at uh, American Kidney Institute, Vijayawada. She has a lot of experience right from uh, the, uh, uh, the hospice care and palliative medicine in uh, American board, pediatric medicine in American board, internal medicine as well in American board and the nephrology. I think she has a lot of experience in uh, the uh, API, in uh, the uh, CRRT and API. So uh, coming to the topic, uh, the cytokine, uh, uh, absorption in uh, acute kidney injury. I think it has gone uh, a lot of uh, uh, what they call literature has evolved in this topic, not only from AKI, but after the code, I think we have uh, also learned about using these uh, the extra pulpur therapies in uh, the COVID treatment as well. So, uh, coming to my experience, I think we had a few of the patients initiated on the cytokine uh, the, I mean, uh, absorption therapy. But it's not been very successful. Out of uh, four to five patients, I think we have only one patient who had successfully recovered after the AKI. And uh, we had few experience even with the COVID because I mean, uh, despite not having an AKI, so as you know, it is the cytokine uh, storm which has I mean, involved the lung and then has involved the lung damage. I think uh, there were a lot of requests as a nephrologist to whether they can do uh, you know, cytoabsorption therapy in, even in COVID patients. And one more experience as a transplant, uh, you know, the uh, heading the transplant program of the state, uh, we also had a lot of requests uh, through because it can be, uh, you know, used in association with ECMO also. So there have been a lot of, I uh, mean, you know, uh, the uh, I mean, uh, experience with uh, using this in adjunct to ECMO therapy to prolong the, you know, the, uh, the um, patients on lung injury and subse subsequently for the lung transplantation. So with this introduction, I would like to invite uh, the, the speaker. Uh, to uh, take, take up the uh, the topic, the cyto, cytokine absorption therapy in the API. 
and I would uh, like to, uh, Swapna to take over the platform and uh, speak on her experience. I think we can, uh, I mean, have a questions after her uh, talk. Over to you, Dr. Swapna, please. Thank you, Dr. Swarnalata. Uh, actually, there was a little power out. I missed the initial part, but anyway, thanks for the nice introduction. Um, so my topic is cytokine ad adsorption therapy in sepsis, AKI. Uh, I, I would like to start off with a, a case presentation that uh, we did as uh, uh, it was a COVID patient. Uh, this is a 55-year-old uh, male patient, diabetic uh, from 10 years. Hello. <laughs> Uh, am I audible? But your screen is not, uh, only you are uh, visible, but not your screen. Please share the screen, ma'am. Yeah, now it is seen. Now it is seen? Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. So this is a case presentation I would like to start off the, the topic with. So 55-year-old male, uh, diabetic from 10 years, known CKD, baseline creatinine was 1.7. Uh, hypertensive and uh, he was a uh, bypass patient. Uh, so he was admitted with cough, fever, shortness of breath from three days, and had recent exposure to a COVID uh, patient at home. He was not vaccinated. He had no history of smoking. Uh, patient on uh, during initial visit was slightly tachypneic in the mid-20s. Blood pressures were 110 over 60, uh, heart rate of 110, had coarse breath sounds. Um, initial workup uh, showed a creatinine of 2, uh, elevated D-dimer slightly at 294, 250 was the upper limit of normal for our lab and the LDH was 615 and ferritin was high at 1300s and he was uncontrolled diabetic. Uh, his how to sats were 90% on room air. Uh, obviously rapid antigen was positive and uh, CT severity score was 14 out of 25. So patient was started on the routine treatment like uh, oxygen therapy, IV remdesivir, uh, IV solumedrol, and since the sugars were high, he was on insulin drip and uh, IV antibiotics, and uh, he was on Eliquis at home for some AFib, I think. So that was continued. And his interleukin-6 was elevated on day two. I think day one was normal. On day two, it was up to 10, uh, the range being two to seven for our lab. And uh, uh, as it was elevated, we gave the targeted immunomodulation toclizumab for him. On day three, he was still requiring three to four liters of oxygen. Um, and day four, he had persistent hypoxia with worsening respiratory distress and ended up being intubated and uh, placed on the ventilator. Uh, so Deshan was asked about initially starting on uh, uh, cytosorbing on day two, looking at the elevated interleukin-6, but the family was not Four, as the creatinine was worsening and also the interleukin six levels being elevated uh, to 27 and all the other parameters being elevated like ferritin levels and D-dimers, uh, we started him on the cytosop therapy uh, with CVVHD. There was also worsening metabolic acidosis. So in, and he had persistent hypoxia in spite of being on the ventilator at 100% oxygen. Cytosop was continued for 48 hours. Uh, but patient continued to worse and uh, the cy cytokine storm worsened and uh, he had ARDS and he succumbed. So based on this, I want to bring about like what uh, uh, a few definitions here as the other speakers have told. Sepsis is a life-threatening organ dysfunction associated with the dysregulated host response to an infection. And a continuum of it is septic shock. It is a subtype of sepsis with more substantial hemodynamic and metabolic deteriorations and more elevated risk of death. Criteria being persistent hypotension necessitating vasopressor medications uh, to maintain MAP of greater than 65 and persistently elevated serum lactate levels in spite of volume resuscitation. Um, and then AKI definition, according to the 2012 KDGO guidelines, increase in serum creatinine greater than 0.3 uh, 
milligrams in 48 hours or greater than 1.5 times the baseline within the prior seven days or decrease in urine volume less than 0.5 ml per kilogram per hour for six hours. So a brief epidemiology and pathophysiology, I think others have explained this in detail. The incidence of AKI in sepsis is 40% and about 40 to 60% with septic shock. Septic AKI accounts for 50% of all AKI patients and risk factors being septic shock, high markers of disease severity, comorbidities and uh, positive blood culture infections. Uh, pathophysiology is still incompletely understood, but uh, the main things are pro and anti-inflammatory cytokine responses to severe infection uh, contribute to this septic AKI. And there are some adverse micro and macro uh, vascular changes in the kidney, which are also responsible for this. So basically, I'm going to talk about this cytokine storm in septic shock because the other yeah. topics. All the time is fighting with me. All the time is talking with me. Because the other side of the table, you can't get off and day. Somebody has to mute their. Uh... Hello. Yeah, I have muted. Sai uh, Sapna, you go on. Okay, so the cytokine storm and septic shock, the immune system is responsible for recognizing foreign invaders responding to the pathogen burden and restoring homeostasis back to normal during the infection. So a cytokine storm occurs, there's a cascade of several adverse immune dysregulation disorders. You have both pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines and which in, in fact cause the collateral organ damage. So pro-inflammatory cytokines are the interleukin-1, which is a family of 11 cytokines, and the interleukin-6, 17, and the tumor necrosis factor. Anti-inflammatory cytokines are uh, interleukin-4, interleukin-10, and TGF-beta, which try to decrease the intensity of the inflammatory response. Interleukin-8 is there, which attracts different types of uh, white blood cells into targeted uh, peripheral tissue during the infection. Uh, to combat the infection. And then these other types like interferons, which help in the virus, uh, in the defending against all types of viruses. Type one and type three mainly uh, uh, kind of help with uh, defending against viruses. Type two uh, increases uh, macrophage activation and tissue antigen expression and causes symptoms like fever, chills, and fatigue. Then what happens in septic shock? Uh, so detection of uh, microbes and tissue damage causes release of these uh, pathogen associated molecular uh, patterns and uh, damage associated molecular patterns, which in turn activate the various types of cells like macrophages, T lymphocytes, neutrophils and endothelial cells to release all these inflammatory cytokines, some of which are anti-inflammatory and some of which are pro-inflammatory, especially interleukin-10 is uh, anti-inflammatory. And all these in turn cause systemic inflammatory response syndrome, activation of the coagulation, cascade and multi-organ failure and death. So what are the symptoms or effects? Early symptoms related to cytokine storm are fever, fatigue, myalgias, arthralgias, headache, rash, diarrhea, anorexia, and neuropsychiatric disorders. Later effects are hypoxia, dyspnea, hypotension, vasodilatory shock, DIC with vascular thrombosis or catastrophic hemorrhages. And uh, severe cases of cytokine storm can lead to renal failure, acute liver injury, and uh, stress-related tecosubo like cardiomyopathies and deaths. So lab findings in cytokine storm are elevated CRPs, procalcitonin, ferritin, D-dimers, can have leukocytosis or leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, anemia, and increased levels of IL-6, IL-10, and interferon gammas. The precise measurement, the difficulty is the precise measurement can be difficult due to short half-lives of these molecules. And not all facilities have the uh, option to measure these levels. And uh, the levels can uh, be affected uh, by uh, carrying to outside labs. So proper detection is important um, because it's all time sensitive. So treatment strategies available for uh, septic shock induced cytokine storm, mainly supportive care to maintain critical organ function like fluids, vasopressors, antibiotics, 
antivirals, antifungals, then elimination of the triggers, both exogenous and endogenous, uh, which are activating the immune system. And then targeted immunomodulation, like uh, you know, IL-6 antagonist toxicizumab was used in the COVID-19 time. Then non-specific immunosuppression, if we can suppress all the receptors with the corticosteroids so that it can limit the collateral damage uh, caused by the uh, adversely activated immune system where eliminating the infection is not possible or the triggering pathogen is not possible. Like we didn't know how this is caused during the COVID pandemic. And then removal of cytokines with the blood purification therapies to at least improve the immune homeostasis. So coming to the three main blood purification techniques available were hemofiltration, uh, dialysis or diffusion and adsorption. So these are the various uh, filters, uh, CVVHD, high cutoff membranes, um, where they, they are absorbing some interleukins, medium cutoff membranes, like oxidase and emic ultra flux. Oxidase, uh, we're we going to talk about it later. Uh, it also helps with endotoxin removal. And then hemoadsorption with the cytosol, which we have used in our patient and the HA330 and 380 filters, the Jaffron uh, based and the polymyxin B and coupled plasma filtration and adsorption. So these are the types of uh, therapies like convective therapies, high volume, high filtration and high cutoff membrane. Hybrid therapies like convection plus adsorption like uh, coupled plasma filtration and adsorption then purely adsorptive and uh, other novel techniques like renal tubular assistance, selective cytophoresis. And the types of membranes are non-selective membranes like AN69, uh, polymethyl, methylate, acrylate, and PEPA. Semi-selective membranes, AN69, oxyrus, selective cartri cartridges like polymyxin B, hemoperfusion, and non-selective cartridges are cytosol. So the cutoff membrane describes the smallest molecular weight of a solute that it retains. So the cutoff value of high cutoff membranes is generally considered to approximate to that of uh, albumin, which is 65 kilo daltons. And our standard RRT low flux membranes have cutoff values ranging between 10 and 30. Medium cutoff membranes fall between low cutoff and high cutoff, that is 35 to 45, uh, which uh, goes with the oxidative membrane. Most cytokines have molecular weights between 8 and 16. And uh, the currently available HCO membranes are septex, uh, which are used mostly in CRRTs and Theralite in intermediate uh, hemodialysis. And these are marketed by Baxter. Auxiris hemofilter, which is Baxter-based, is a medium cutoff, 35 to 40 kilodalton, uh, as is AN69, polyacrylonitrile methylyl sulfonate based membrane coated with uh, positively charged polyethylene amine, PEI, and pre-grafted with 4500 uh, 4, IU of heparin per meter square. What it does is the positively charged PEI coating enables the adsorption of negatively charged endotoxins in addition to the cytokine ad adsorption and in addition to the renal replacement properties with the AN69 hemofilter. So I have a small diagram of it, of its cross section where you know that uh, the first layer has the AN69 co-molymer hydro hydrogel. It adsorbs cytokines, removes solutes via convection through membrane pores. A cutoff is 40 kilodaltons. And the second layer has multiple layers of PEI, uh, which is positively charged and it attracts the negatively charged endotoxins uh, to absorb the, uh, adsorb the endotoxins. Okay, and the third layer is heparin grafted and it reduces the local thrombosity. So that is why this filter is of much use, but the uh, downside is it can only be used with a CRRT machine. So to efficacy of Oxiris, uh, there was one study done by Broman et al. Uh, it was a crossover double bind trial to receive CRRT with an Oxiris filter or with a standard filter. Both contain AN69 for the first 24 hours of treatment endotoxin concentration decreased significantly more in the oxidase group. Cytokines were decreased significantly uh, in both groups. 
but uh, auxiris uh, provided a double advantage of covering the endotoxins also. And uh, there was improvement in lactate levels and the dosage of norepinephrine was significantly decreased in the auxiris group. Then cytosorb uh, filters. Cytosorbs is an extracorporeal blood purification device targeting the removal of cytokines in the low to middle molecular weight range, 10 to 55. And uh, it is highly porous, pyrolidone coated polystyrene divinyl benzene polymer beads. Uh, it helps in uh, more than 95% removal of pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines, including IL-6, IL-10. Um, so, and it is superior in efficacy to the high cutoff filters, MIC-2. And, uh, but the disadvantage is um, did not remove endotoxins. And it also is associated with thrombocytopenia and mild plasma protein loss. There was about 7.6 grams of protein loss uh, with uh, 24 to 48 hours of therapy with this. Then polymyxin B, hemoadsorption, toremyxin is the brand name. Endotoxin uh, is an essential component of gram-negative bacterial cell walls, so lipopolysaccharide. So hemoadsorption using this polystyrene fibers with immobilized polymyxin B. It was, this was first approved in uh, 1994 in Japan. It's a polycationic antibiotic, which binds the lipid A portion of the endotoxin and neutralizes its toxicity. So there was one trial called UFAS trial. Uh, it was a randomized control trial examining the effects of uh, polymyxin B hemoadsorption on 28-day mortality. Study patients were all uh, intra-abdominal sepsis or septic shock patients due to gram-negative bacteria. And uh, patients had... Uh, uh, mean arterial pressures, it was done for two days, uh, two hour sessions and mean arterial pressures increased and so far scores declined with uh, this uh, polymyxin B hemoadsorption and mortality was lower in this group. So this is a slide showing uh, some of the characteristics of the selective membranes and cartridges. So AN69 ST, AN69 oxidus, this is oxidus. This is a regular, uh, <clears throat> this is the polymyxin B and cytosol. So cytosol removes up to 60 kilo daltons. Okay, and auxiris up to 35. Um, and it also, uh, the timing of intervention during sepsis, um, auxiris, you have to start this early if uh, endotoxin assay is not available. Even this is the same. And uh, polymyxin B hemoperfusion, it's better to start early, even before multi-organ dysfunction and AKI is set in. And cytosorb, uh, the timing, uh, actually it was added to CRRT in many studies. This is also telling about the reported results, like high volume hemofiltration. Uh, aim was non-selective removal of inflammatory mediators. The principle is convection. It reduces vasopressor requirements, reduces concentration of inflammatory mediators in blood, and observed mortality lower than in predicted mortality. And the newer uh, uh, therapies uh, were uh, renal assist device, and uh, which are ba cell-based therapies, and extracorporeal immune support system, which are also cell-based therapies and leukocyte inhibition module, also antibody-based therapies. These I'm going to show you in different slides. Uh, polymyxin B is selective. This is already told, so I will go to proceed. So most commonly used adsorption cartridges and their prescriptions. So toramyxin, polymyxin B, immobilized fiber, indication severe sepsis and septic shock, toxins removed are endotoxins. The prescription is for two hours daily for two consecutive days and the blood flow rates of 80 to 120. Anticoagulation is with heparin. Additional features are if there is no renal failure, then the polymyxin B effect can be used. Uh, cytosorb, the porous polymer beads used in severe sepsis and septic shock and cardiac surgery with SIRS. Uh, the toxins removed are cytokines, anaphylactic toxins, Rhabdo patients, um, liver patients like bilirubin, bile acids, toxins and metals and drugs. 
and uh, it's, it's usually 24 hour therapy daily for two to seven consecutive days and blood flow rates of 150 to 700 were used anticoagulation heparin or citrate can be used and it has the largest surface area Auxiris, as I said, AN69 based membrane surface treated with polyethylene imine and grafted with heparin. It is also used in severe sepsis and septic shock, advantage of removing both endotoxin and cytokines. So it's, uh, it needs a CRRT machine. So prescribed dose is greater than 35 ml per kilogram per hour. Filter replacement after 24 hours if there is or if there is no reduction in vasopressor dose by 50%. And treatment should be stopped if vasopressors are reduced by greater than 50% or after days of three days of treatment, no response. Blood flow rates are 100 to 450. Uh, additional features, low risk of thrombogenicity by absorbing antithrombin-3 from the blood because it is heparin coated. And uh, this is a lipopolysaccharide absorber, not much of uh, experience with this. HA330, the jaffron-based, the styrene divinyl benzene copolymers used for also used for severe sepsis and septic shock helps with removing cytokines complements and free hemoglobin uh, prescription is two to six hours daily for two days blood flow rates of 100 to 300 and uh, anticoagulation heparin or citrate can be used so this based on the uh, pathways and uh, based on what is expressed more during the in each individual patient's sepsis the type of filter is decided so if it is more of uh, endotoxin based and uh, you know uh, gram negative sepsis we pick more of oxirus and uh, lipopolysaccharide or polymyxin b if it is more of cytokine strong and uh, sepsis related to uh, you know recent uh, covid pandemics like that then we go for the cytosorb auxiris if the CRRT machine is available and these are the other therapies. So timing of initiation, I think this is what uh, my previous speaker Dr. Shiva Parvati also was mentioning, like what all guidelines say it's different but it depends on what <laughs> individual patient is going through. So this is a pro-inflammatory arm and the anti-inflammatory cytokines. Okay, when we start in phase B, cytokine strong, like the patient will get likely maximal benefit from the extracorporeal therapies uh, because A is adaptive immune response and ECT is likely harmful. And C is a phase where, you know, the counteractive anti-inflammatory arm is restoring the immune behavior. So you're trying to remove the good cytokines also if you start in this phase. So the timing is important. This slide, that is why I'm trying to reinforce. Even in our patient, if we have started on the second day, we would have seen a better response is what we felt. Because if we waited until the interleukin levels, in six levels rose and uh, ferritin levels were high because there were other issues, family didn't agree and all this. So likely a tip off tip over point beyond which any cytokine removal therapy might be counterproductive. Like don't, uh, like don't wait until the last moment, until you're in a severe cytokine strong. These are the novel therapies, extracorporeal immune support system. Um, so where uh, the patient's plasma is first separated by filtration or centrifugation. The plasma then passes through a bioreactor containing phagocytes and, uh, and inside the human phagocytic cells uh, remove from the patient's blood the antigenic and apoptotic material and um, which are not cleared by the patient's own neutrophils and macrophages and it is again given back through a cell filter into the patient. But these are all novel therapies still in research and then this is a leukocyte inhibition module where Activated neutrophils are there in the blood, come in contact with the, the stimulating antibodies and uh, which are bound to the membrane. This is the membrane and they're rapidly inactivated within minutes and they begin to undergo apoptosis. And these inactivated neutrophils can then be cleared from the blood by phagocytosis or sequestration in the spleen. 
So decision making strategy, like which filter to use and uh, when to start. Uh, so severe sepsis or septic shock with kidney injury, like you have oliguria after resuscitation less than 100 ml in six hours, fluid overload greater than 10% of the body weight, metabolic acidosis, pH less than 7.2, hyperkalemia greater than six, serum creatinine greater than four. All these factors are there. Start off with your regular CVVHT. And uh, as the storm sets in, then we can add a status of filter to this. Then severe sepsis without, without kidney injury. You see patient is in septic shock with endotoxemia. Like uh, endotoxin assays are checked. And uh, if you have that, then you can go with the polymyxin B filters or the oxidus. And then septic shock with cytokine storm, you can go with the Oxidus, cytosorb, or HA330 or TAT. Thank you, and end of presentation. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. That was a nice lecture uh, from uh, Sai Swapna. Madam, I want to share my experience regarding this uh, adsorption therapies. Uh, till uh, till now, we have done 31 of uh, polymethyl methacrylate hemophil, that is uh, hemophil cytokine adsorption, and oxide is 5, and majority of them were in COVID, and in COVID, only two were survived, but other than COVID, so many were recovered, and uh, um, among our hemophil, that is polymethyl methacrylate, 12 were live and 19 were expired. And in Oxiris, 2 were live and 3 were expired. And among all this, the time of initiation is very important. If we start at the end, the outcome is very bad. If we start at the initiation of uh, uh, that septic shock, uh, uh, if we suspect, as uh, Siva Parvati told, if we suspect this patient will go into septic shock and her, uh, his inotropic support was increasing, then at that time, these uh, uh, cytokine adsorption therapies helps a lot. Uh, but uh, uh, in uh, uh, recent KDGO AKI uh, consensus uh, meet, they have approved for the cytokine adsorption like a suggestion, not a recommendation. Yes. Thank you. I think it's better not to wait until the storm sets in. Yeah, time is very important. Time is important, yes. Yeah, thank you, uh, Swapna. It was a very wonderful talk. In fact, we have covered everything, including the you know molecular mechanisms of uh, uh, cytokine to you know the not only the conventional uh, extracellular ther therapies, but also you know, novel therapies, including the high cut off membranes and then you know cytosol everything. So I think there is not a lot of uh, literature randomized control trials, but uh, the experience is definitely evolving. And uh, like uh, how she I mean uh, Shaimani has shared that, uh, and you should start it early. Early initiation is you know you can have uh, you can expect better outcomes rather than waiting for the patient to succumb to hypotension with multiple inotropes and cytokine syndrome. So outcomes are not very good. And we shared a similar experience. Very good job, Sapna. And the uh, and I would like to thank uh, again the uh, WIN uh, uh, AP chapter for a wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, thank Matt. You. Next, we move on to question and answer session. Uh, in the chat box, there were only two questions. Uh, one is... Uh, and I request all the speakers to be available and uh, okay. and unmute them they, themselves for the question and answer session. Speakers and moderators, please be available for the question and answer session. And uh, till now there are two only two questions. One is the uh, anticoagulation used in our patient. Uh, as the patient is having platelet count of 28,000, we have done heparin free. As uh, we have uh, oxide, we have CRRT mission, and we have initiated her on oxide after counseling them. And this oxide is a self coated, a heparin coated. So we need not give heparin. So it has run, uh, it has worked for 24 hours as the source was controlled. And we need not give long, uh, long term hemodialysis for her. And the next question is how to differentiate between uremic cardiomyopathy and septic cardiomyopathy? Uh, 
and cardiomyopathy is same and in this case she was having both uremia and uh, sepsis as the uh, urea was uh, 125 and uh, uh, pro procalcitonin was 90 and her the reason for her cardiomyopathy may be both and i request other seniors to uh, explain this better if they are there any comments on this question you to how to differentiate uremic cardiomyopathy and septic cardiomyopathy no uh, i think clinically it's very difficult to differentiate between uh, the septic and then uh, you know the uh, uremic cardiomyopathy it all depends upon the underlying comorbid conditions and you know whether underlying ckd was there or you know, diabetes hypertension was there otherwise you know like uh, the it all depends upon the patient profile young patient without any comorbid condition and severe sepsis goes more more in favor with the uh, when biomarkers favoring towards sepsis goes more in favor of septic cardiomyopathy rather than the uremic that's what i believe okay and, uh, in uh, actually what they say is uh, response to therapy is also one of the differentiating feature so if it is uremic cardiomyopathy the patient's response will be very good they feel uh, the shortness of breath has been improved and uh, they are feeling better if a feeling of wellness is seen if it is secondary to uremia the patient's experience after they have undergone dialysis so sometimes response to therapy also will help to differentiate between uh, uremic and uh, septic cardiomyopathy yeah great if the patient responds to rrt this might yeah. be uremic and but uh, uh, anyway in parallel we will start on uh, broad spectrum antibiotics if mm-hmm. appropriate antibiotic was given even the septic cardiomyopathy also will improve and one more thing is there and, will be a uh, lot of tachycardia in patients with the septic cardiomyopathy which is not yeah, just seen not in like uremia it is bradycardia uremic cardiomyopathy patients will be having bradycardia because of uremic toxins but in septic cardiomyopathy it will be lot of tachycardia will be there because they also have associated uh, myocarditis yeah great but no hard and rule uh, hard yeah. fast rule because even uremic cardiomyopathy may have might uh, hy- they might have hypokalemia and all not the hyperkalemia that time we may get uh, other way wrong okay um, Uh, one more thing i would just like to add is uh, we can even uh, look at the uh, ultrasound of the heart in septic cardi- uh, cardiac patients you have something called as tachycardic cardiomyopathy so basically the heart shape itself is kind of kind of bottle kind of thing and uh, the uh, uh, dysfunction will be a global dysfunction which you will see in a septic but not all septic patients need to have but if you have that feature you can say probably it's more of septic cardiomyopathy uh I think Kavita Ma'am has asked two questions. How to know that which AK patient will progress to chronic kidney disease? As of now, there are no uh, uh, strict markers to see that this patient is going to develop into CKD. But they say that in the long-term follow-up studies, patients who are continuing to have hypertension and who are continuing to have proteinuria even after recovery of an acute episode of acute kidney injury. they are more likely develop into ckd that is why we ask them to come in regular follow ups to us every 3 months and we assess their blood pressure so persistent hypertension and persistent proteinuria are uh, one of the two markers which are present at least now to uh, see, to know that this patient is probably going to have ckd and one more thing is if their uh, baseline function is compromised that means a pure patient with aki when compared to patient with acute on ckd a patient with acute on ckd is going to progress faster to ckd than a patient with aki to ckd and uh, one more question dr kavita has asked any role for crrt in acute liver failure although there is no clear cut uh, indication for crrt in acute liver failure because in acute liver failure we are going to do another modality of uh, replacement that is called as mars that is molecular adsorbent reassorption technology uh in that we use albumin filters and uh, uh we use uh, uh, so that the bilirubin is uh, removed from that but uh, it is to remember that this mars is also going to act only as a bridge therapy to liver transplantation only once you have that patient is going to have liver transplantation then only we are going to give uh, 
this uh, liver support as well as renal support for patients with acute liver failure because the mortality is very high in patients with acute liver failure. I think I have answered the two questions uh, to Dr. Kavita ma'am. My experience with acute liver failure ma'am is that basically when uh, patients have very high bilirubin, like some of the uh, hepatologists in our setup in Ramchandra, what they ask is, uh, one, they ask for CRRT in two settings. One is a um, patient with very high bilirubin, but stable SGOTPD, like bilirubin of 25, 30. They ask for a CRRT just to get the bilirubin down. So though there is no hard evidence, I do not know about that for one for that. And other is when patients present with um, yellow phosphorus reticular poisoning, uh, when we start the CRRT early in such patients, we have noticed even before he starts having like severe grade two or grade three hepatic NKF, uh, we have had two mm -hmm. kind of settings. Some patients we have started in CRRT little late. So such patients do not show a response at all. When they become sick and urine output decreases and other uh, organ failure. But if we start the CRRT a little early, like when just the SGOTPT itself is rising, but all other parameters are setting, we've noticed that there is some improvement. But though there is no hard evidence on it, so I just wanted to know your experience regarding that, how it is uh, about the CRRT role in that. And yeah. even patients with high ammonia, we uh, try to do that. Yeah. As of now, we don't uh, do CRRT regularly for raised bilirubin levels alone. So if the patient is having encephalopathy, again, that comes under patient with cerebral edema. In that case, CRRT might help the patients. And uh, I have experience with rat poisoning in two patients where we have done plasma exchange to that patient. Because uh, there is some literature telling about the effect of plasma exchange in patients with rat poisoning, especially that phosphorus poisoning. And I have not tried CRRT in rat poisoning at all. And I have an, one experience with severe alcohol liver injury with renal failure. And we have done even cytokine adsorption because of elevated procal of 90. Uh, but uh, the patient was succumbed. The patient was not improved. And I have seen that presence of liver injury is a bad outcome in all these cytokine adsorption system. If it is high, the outcome will be uh, bad. And even the uh, sepsis, the uro, uh, as Kavita pointed out in her se uh, session, urosepsis is a good thing. We can treat it early by digestenting and all. But the pneumonias, and they are progressed to ARDS, their outcome is very bad, even with all these cytokines and cytokine adsorption therapies. Uh, that, yeah. was, uh, uh, that was, I have faced during uh, uh, these uh, COVID sessions. We have done so many hemophiles and oxidase. Uh, initially, the vitals were improved, but uh, at last, uh, the uh, death was the outcome. But after COVID, we have good outcomes with this uh, cytokine adsorption system. Actually, that's why I have pointed out that the Cori cycle in the beginning of my presentation, because all these patients end up with hyperlactatemia. That is more so in patients with liver failure. And the problem with liver failure is no replacement is permanent, except for liver transplantation. Whatever we are doing is only a bridging the gap to transplantation. As of now, that is the status for liver failure patients. And it is an ominous sign in uh, either sepsis patients or other patients with multi-organ dysfunctions. Can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. My question is, actually, I have never really understood. Uh, you said the source of sepsis control in an acute pyelonephritis. How does digestenting help? <laughs> this, is, this is a question which I have never understood because when there is a... Uh, acute pyelonephritis without obstruction, of course. I'm not talking yeah. of obstruction. Uh, uh, all our patients are stented uh, saying that this, uh, you are, like Saivani also said that we are doing a sepsis, I mean, the source control. I want to know how does it really help? I mean, this is because I have not understood it. Can I ask her, ma'am? Because I deal more of urosepsis cases because, because we are uro and nephro combination. In Tilpati. Okay. Sir, madam. Yeah, yeah. Nagajoti. Yeah. Hello. Said, yeah. Yeah, ma'am. Yeah, Eurocepsis. Usually they think that acute pyelonephritis, uh, digestenting do help, even a physician. So number of nephrologists might be thinking of that. Cortical parenchymal infections cannot be treated with digestenting. 
cortical parenchymal infections are to be treated with IV antibody. These are still is use, use, useful only if there is evidence of obstruction. That is exactly no, no. That is exactly what I'm asking, Nagajyoti. But and because if you see in ICU, every patient, even if there is an if there is no nephritis, madam, A K S then no I have prolonged digestion. That, that is exactly how. how answer this question, madam. No, that one minute. Then this is exactly how understand I understand the pathophysiology. If there is a just a parenchymal infection, how is your digestion going to help? At present, I am having a, a case in my ICU, madam. She is an old lady who was treated under a physician. She was having severe pyonephrosis. Uh, pus, pus, they put a catheter. Pus was all drained. The initial creatine was only 0.9. He didn't uh, get the creatine after 48 hours. After she, she was having abnormal breathing, the intensivist has sent the creatine. Her creatine was about 6.6. .6. With metabolic acidosis, he asked for a neurologist opinion. My husband said, oh, there is only uh, enlargement of cortical parenchyma, no evidence of obstruction since the beginning. How could I uh, digestion help? We abandoned a digestant uh, and uh, we have taken her for dialysis and with IV antibiotics. I have explained them, I have no role of digestant. The, the patient has developed AKI, so it takes time for AKI. You have to do dialysis until AKI recovers. The sepsis part has been recovered because of IV antibiotics. The counts has come down. Uh, the CRP levels are come down, no add to sepsis, hemodynamic is stable. Only the, uh, the present uh, scenario is AKE is persisting. She has progressed into AKD, which is still dialysis dependent. We abandoned digestion because it's only enlarged, uh, enlarged bulky kidney with uh, no evidence of obstruction, even in the CT or uh, re revised ultrasound. So she, her urine output is improve, improving. I have, done take, I have taken her for two dialysis sessions. Now her urine output is improving about uh, 75 ml. Now she has entered just into diuretic phase, but creatinine has not come down. This is third session today. I'm going to take her for third session. Now, I, I, don't want, think... I wanted Saivani to answer this question because yeah. she would have read extensively about this. You said that source I... control was done with uh, digestenting. That's why I'm asking you, Saivani, how does digestenting help? Madam, actually, I have experience of five years. And before this classical case, I do thought like this only, madam. Uh, there is no role of digestenting in simple pyelonephritis except hydroureteronephrosis. But uh, she is a case of diabetic with 590 creatinine. She may she might be having papillary necrosis causing obstruction. Yeah. In that case, sometimes papillary nephrosis can present but, with but, uh, but we can't and we can't uh, uh, evaluate and we can't show that she is having papillary necrosis as we have we can't do contrast CT. And it's the only thing we have seen is the bulky kidney. And three days I have waited. Will she, uh, she will improve with uh, uh, antibiotics and cholestine and the, uh, and the oxidase. But the outcome was not good. So I thought we can ask the help of a urologist. And I after the after uh, digestinting initiation, she had polyuria, madam. Initially she was anuria. And then she, her urine output was increasing and her uh, uh, inotropic support was decreasing. And I thought maybe as she was diabetic, she might be having papillary necrosis and obstruction, which was relieved by this digestant. And so the source was controlled. In so, the with the antibiotics. so the bottom line is nephrologists understand that digestenting will help only if there is obstruction. A urologist may think otherwise. So that's the bottom line. You also yeah. say that there could be a papillary necrosis which has not manifested as a hydronephrosis. That yes. is your explanation. So bottom line is you also say that there is there could be some obstruction. Yes, ma'am. So, so, madam, if I can add here to the discussion, very interesting question you have asked. And, uh, uh, madam, how uh, I, can so, so I, I agree. I agree with both of them. See, sometimes what happens is hydronephrosis may be there, but if the kidney yes. is in renal failure, the urine yes. output yes. is not efficient yes. and the hydronephrosis may not be apparent. The yes. other thing yes. is there may be sometimes a minimal ureteric edema also. So ureteric edema, uh, that, that also, so stem is, I mean, one more tool in our armamentarium. So your question is very right. If like the parenchymal part of the infection, it won't control. But it's very difficult to rule out an obstruction many of the times. 
and sometimes the uh, the contrast procedures we cannot do because ma'am we can go for on table rgp madam we yeah, can do it yeah, uh, absolutely nagjyoti i am not against what I'm you are telling what you are what my statement is i agree with both of you so what you are telling is fine if you are able to rule out obstruction by doing an on table rgp or all those things fine absolutely fine but i am just trying to understand and explain the logic behind a stenting in a so called absent hydronephrosis with pyelonephritis so sometimes yeah. what happens is we may not be able to pick it up so that, that's the explanation madam recently well, I have can, can i yeah. the the dictum is absence of hydronephrosis does not exclude obstruction of a pelvic ulcer system madam absolutely absolutely and there are papers on this madam there are papers there are papers on this role of bj stenting in patients of pyelonephritis without yeah, yeah. apparent obstruction apparent so uh, only hydronephrosis on a ct or radiological imaging no absence of hydronephrosis cannot exclude an obstruction there might be several reasons why a hydronephrosis cannot be manifested on a radiological investigation so we should go by clinically madam and another case madam recently 20, 19 year unmarried girl uh, and presented with bilateral pyelonephritis bulky kidneys and we have kept her on iv antibiotics for 3 days with meropenem and cholesterol but she was not improved after that we have uh, taken urology help and he kept bilateral dj stenting immediately her pain abdomen decreased and her fever came down and she was recovered madam her counts came down i thought what this the, is the what is the reason for bilateral pyelonephritis bani for bilateral pyelonephritis yeah, we have to evaluate your urogenic bladders no her pvr was normal i i have evaluated for everything her pvr was not not at that young girl non diabetic and non hypertensive oh, maybe maybe a neurogenic bladder or ruckel spina bifida could be okay doesn't matter there will be no end to this discussion if we can go on and on but why <laughs> while while i agree with what manisha says there could be some uretric edema we should also be very clear that by doing a dg stent we are not in introducing another infection okay. which was not there so yeah. with that we'll close one more question uh, of course it's not a question it's just with no uh, um i mean like uh, we, we were all talking about uh, salvaging optimization giving boluses this is another problem that we see in our icus uh, the patients are really low, overloaded and then like you know um, we keep telling them that once there is an established akia you have gone from the first 48 hours resuscitation after that the patient has no output and you load uh, you make the patients uh, load with about 6 liters 10 liters 15 liters and then you ask us to dialyze so that's another thing i think we should we should not overload the patient once we are through the stage of salvage and we should be very careful about giving fluids because uh, no the more dialysis you give to the patient it is not going to benefit him in the long term from aki the patient could land in akd and ckd Yes, yeah. ma'am. Everyone faces the same. The intense risk uh, fluid yeah. o- overload the patients, and ne- then call the nephrologist. Okay. Early yeah. referral to the nephrologist and judicious follow of a nephrologist order in fluid therapy might improve the patient outcome. Okay, that, so that we should educate our interns with and general physicians, ma'am. They will not uh, change even after repeated. Probably develop some uh, uh, the simple protocols which uh, Saivani was telling. because nobody wants to directly i am mean, an intensivist may not be interested in reading the whole theory and all so 1 2 3 4 5 these things like the one hour bundle all those things those things help and practices do change change over a period of time not immediately but we okay. are on the right track and every time the maintenance therapy will be going on madam on normal saline of 50 ml per hour like that no we should What? take the patient and we should give the bolus they should be educated yeah so that's why probably fix up some protocol simple protocols without theory only the practical points 1 2 3 4 5 in your icu that can you can you do that for us manish and send it to me so i'll give it to my icu people aivani is going to do it for all of us and send it to us madam i will do it and i will yeah that would be good i think we, we will all add to it aivani that would be really great i mean um i mean if you could compile the basics basics so anyway i i will i will now give room for the others to ask questions i would mm-hmm. uh, i will just stop here only congratulate the 
AP win for uh, arranging such a wonderful uh, uh, seminar, webinar. And uh, I hope win Telangana will soon, fo soon follow suit and think yes, of another very okay. important practical topic for discussion. Ma'am, I have one. Uh, can I ask one question, Vani, regarding the yeah, inotropes, uh, inotropes of choice in uh, sepsis AK? Mm -hmm. Everyone was talk talking about norepinephrine and vasopressin, but surviving sepsis guidelines have highlighted that uh, epinephrine is a good inotrope rather than uh, vasopressin. And uh, I think most of the, in my ISO, I'm for the past six years, I'm using norepinephrine and epinephrine as a second line. And uh, only vasopressin as a last resort. I don't know whether you're switching directly to vasopressin from norepinephrine because I didn't hear the word epinephrine from many of the speakers as a second line of uh, inotropic. Should I answer choice? this, madam? Uh, actually, norepinephrine is the first choice. Even the okay. latest okay. surviving okay. sepsis okay. guidelines also were saying norepinephrine is the drug of choice. Next, shift over to vasopressin. But why it's not the uh, epinephrine is you are a pediatrician, you are accustomed to epinephrine, but we are general physicians, we are not accustomed to epinephrine. And even the guidelines is not epinephrine to vasopressin. After that, if cardiac dysfunction is there, then go ahead with the dobutamine or epinephrine. Yeah, that's what I am saying. Epinephrine is completely excluded from vasopressor of choice. I don't... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of arrhythmias. These people are more prone for arrhythmias. Because that is for, do for dopamine and not epinephrine. Actually, survival sexist guidelines say that either you can go with a warm shock, cold shock. Huh? If it is a warm shock, it's now not warm a warm shock. Uh, it, these all things are in pediatrics, madam. Yeah, now warm okay. shock and cold shock are not, not there. using epinephrine at all in your ICU setups in clinical practice. Leave about the guidelines. But I definitely use epinephrine and not epinephrine. Not epinephrine. Resuscitation of CPR and all, everyone use epinephrine only. No, only. No, CPR epinephrine is only the drug of stress. I am saying we you are having a septic shock. A map is not being maintained with not epinephrine. Now you go for up to 20 mics per minute. Then you are saying that add value Vasopressin, a second line of uh, uh, um, vasopressin. But, yeah, uh, even the latest cervical sepsis guideline was also saying uh, that, and they have commented that with epinephrine and dopamine, maybe chance of arrhythmia. No dopamine, no dopamine. I mean, I've stopped using dopamine. I'm using only epinephrine and norepinephrine and epinephrine combination only. Okay. But I had very good uh, results with epinephrine and norepinephrine combination. Most of the sepsis cases have been recovered. But uh, with the third line of vasopressor, like adding vasopressin, I didn't uh, had e any one of the patients have come out. All the three, four patients, everyone who required triple inotropes and a sledded dialysis have succumbed. But with epinephrine and norepinephrine combination, most of them has recovered. Most of them has recovered. I don't know that epinephrine has been removed from vasopressin because I'm practicing it for five to six years. Now I have to revise. I never started vasopressin as a second line of vasopressin. What is the experience of other nephrologists in their eyes? I don't know. Or they're using vasopressin as a second line of vasopressin to norepinephrine. Kavita, will you answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. See, uh, the guidelines, uh, what they say is the first drug of choice would be uh, norepinephrine. Over know, dopamine, dopamine, yeah. because of Over dopamine because of arrhythmic. Over dopamine because of the arrhythmic agent. Okay. The second line would come as vasopressin because it decreases the requirement of vasopressors. One, the uh, chances of renal replacement, all that also has come down. Oh, that is about study. guidelines. What about your clinical experience? How clinical many experience, no. All our patients in Ramchandra, we do first is norepinephrine. When the requirement of norepinephrine goes about 0.3 mics, we switch over to vasopressin. And when the dual vasopressors go on to 0.5 mics and full dose of vasopressin, we initiate on epinephrine. We do not go on to dobutamine unless the patient has got a cardiogenic shock component. Yeah, because, and a cardiogenic yeah, shock. Yeah. Dobutamine, because, uh, dobutamine causes significant amount of waste. Uh, yeah. It will cause vasodilatation. So we do not go for dobutamine unless the heart rate is very high. So our choice would be always initiate on norepinephrine. When the no dose of norepinephrine goes above 0.3 mics, we start on to the vasopressin to decrease the requirement of the vasopressin. So vasopressin and only 0.03 international units per minute. That's yeah, the low dose, the low dose vasopressin, That's not the high dose vasopressin. We can't yeah. go more than that. Yeah, dose yeah. Dose. So and beyond can't... that, you add on to the epinephrine. So that now is what is present gangrene of the limb can occur. So, limb so yeah, what I, I have to present directly because most of the adult patients are cardiac mo cardiac mortality no, no. and morbidity will be present. The so moment you have introduced noradrenaline beyond 0.3 mics, so the vasopressin, yeah, you need to put in a central line. 
you need yeah, to put yeah. a central line you 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 can't give yeah, vasopressin yeah. through coronary yeah. vasopressin is is a complication of a vasopressin it increases a Uh, we haven't of, we, we haven't seen that much we haven't seen that much. so you haven't yeah. seen that much maybe because uh, cad you are having even started in a patients uh, cad diabetic patients yes, yes, yes 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 even when you haven't seen uh, yeah M- we don't see that much we don't see that much we don't see that much the moment you introduce vasopressin you see that the sh- the amount of time the patient remains in an unresponsive shock is less duration so definitely i would say that and one more thing uh, thing i would uh, i would agree with you all we do not go in our icu with much resuscitation of fluids we never go for 5 liters and 10 liters of fluid yeah. at all we always look at the fluid resuscitation goals and beyond 48 hours our goals are like de resuscitation we just take a call whether this patient needs fluids is the patient fluid yeah, ma'am i have checked the surviving yeah. sepsis 2021 guidelines also inotrop guidelines also after hearing your talk but surviving sepsis guidelines 2021 also recommend epinephrine as a second line but certain studies uh, studies have recommended vasopressin as uh, second uh, goal of why not just i have rechecked uh, the literature please go through the survival sepsis 2021 guidelines recommend to me epinephrine a second goal of uh, as a second choice of asopressa survival sepsis okay. but there are studies which are still recommending vasopressa uh, vasopressin as second line but ssc is because survival sepsis is recommending only Uh, what I'm quoting, yeah, and what I'm quoting is from the VAS study. Right. Yeah, right. yeah, what I'm quoting is from the VAS study. I will relook at the surviving yeah, sepsis. Yeah, VAS also. study I have yeah. seen, but surviving yeah. sepsis guidelines 2021 I have rechecked. It is, uh, it is supporting only epinephrine in septic shock. To, okay. So, you... to conclude, uh, okay. Thank you very much. Good session of sepsis AKI, and we had very good academic fees, and I thank. Uh, Uh, our uh, bin uh, bin uh, chapter who has given us the opportunity to organize this webinar and um, dr p n jikki madam bin president ap chapter who was behind me and supporting me in every aspect of this uh, uh, organizing uh, organizing webinar and uh, my medical college team who has supported me in every aspect of this uh, uh, webinar and i thank i my heartfelt thanks to the great uh, moderators dr anuradha madam manisha sahay madam swarnalata madam uttaradas madam and uh, hitaishi madam and uh, jikki madam for moderating the session so well uh, so that we can learn so many learning points from this webinar that is the those things are not written in any books but we can get all these points only from our seniors so i my heartfelt thanks for all these seniors who guided us and moderated us in this webinar and i thank uh, whole heartedly all my speakers who have accepted my request and they have presented very well and they have prevent, uh, presented the topic very well so that we got new points in every every talk and i uh, i thank my postgraduate lata shri due to her uh, small uh, uh, computer problems and all she couldn't log in in the first time but she has uh, helped me a lot in organizing this webinar and collecting all the cvs of speakers and moderators and organizing the thing with the video technology and i thank my uh, video technology without them we, this webinar can't happen and i thank them and i thank all my nephrology department in shantiram medical college from technical and non technical staff who have collected all the data of my patients and uh, helped me to prepare my slides in in this thing and i thank my family uh, and my husband without him i can't be here to present uh, this webinar and i thank almighty for all these things and his grace on me to present this webinar uh, and i i want to uh, tell that within couple of months we'll be back with uh, pregnancy aki webinar symposium similarly and i thank and i i want all the blessings from my seniors and cooperation from my uh, uh, my colleagues for this to conduct without haste and uh, 
to conclude before concluding i want to conclude with a small shloka asatoma sadgamaya tamasoma jyotirgamaya mrutyorma amrutangamaya om shanti 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 hi go oh god please let me from untruth to truth from darkness to light and from immortal uh, from mortal to immortal thank you thank you for giving me this opportunity and thank i at last i uh, thank all the audience who have participated in this webinar despite uh, uh, sunday uh, and uh, taking their precious time uh, and uh, uh, participated in this webinar thank you thank you thank you very much nani thank you one and all thanks everyone and have a great uh, sunday Thank, thank you ma'am thank, thank you ma'am yeah thank you ma'am thank you good day to everyone bye 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 everyone bye manisha thank you Swatham. madam bye ma'am thank you ma'am bye ma'am thank you madam thank you anuradha madam thank you manisha bye 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 thank you